us with an invocation. He is the author of The Political Missionary, Embracing Politics from the Kitchen Table to the World Stage. Please welcome Todd Robotten. Good morning, PLC. How we doing? Good morning. Y'all have more coffee than that. Jeff, I, I don't know. I'm going to have to maybe brew some more. How we doing, PLC? There we go. There we go. It's good to be with you on this 35th anniversary. It's an amazing conference it's been so far. I'm sure it's this morning's conversation today is just going to be just as great. But uh, let's go to our Lord this morning and give you all a, a word of prayer as we go. Dearly Father, I thank you for this day and bringing us all together to be equipped and empowered to what the mission is you have called before us in this world of politics. Lord, we know that it is a mission field, yes, and it is a battlefield in the same respect. So, Lord, allow us to be the Esthers and the Daniels, to be the Mordecais and the Deborahs, to be the Shadrachs, Meshachs, and Abednegoes of our own communities, of our churches, of our families, and yes, in government. Help us, Lord, to use the tools and the, the skills that we have learned here today and go back into our various spheres of influence and be your light, to be your fire, to be your messengers of truth in every aspect of what we do. And Lord, let you be glorified and keep us safe as we do so. And we pray that you bless this food that is prepared and those that have prepared it for us and bless our time today. In Jesus' name, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome this morning's Master of Ceremonies from Let Freedom Ring USA, Colin Hanna. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. This is, I'm glad to see the room is nearly full. You're all wonderful to get up early. This has become one of my favorite parts of the PLC weekend, and I understand from some of our surveys that, that it's yours too. Had nothing to do with me, has everything to do with the quality of the people who are on this panel. We're going to begin with one of the true legends of the conservative movement of conservative journalism, and that is John Gizzi. He has been, <clears throat> was for many years, a, a correspondent with Human Events. He's been with Newsmax and Newsmax TV for the last several years. He has a virtually encyclopedic knowledge of politics in general. In addition to American politics, he's also <clears throat> very up to speed on things that are happening in the Hispanic world, in South America, and so on. John just got back from a trip there, which he may tell you about. John Gizzi has been attending the Pennsylvania Leadership Conference for, I think, maybe every one of the 35 years, this being our 35th annual. So he is one of the true loyal stalwarts. One thing to put in, in your minds before we welcome John, and that has to do with the straw poll. The straw poll will close this morning at 9 a.m., so you've only got an hour and a half. Please complete your straw poll between now and 9 o'clock, but now please join with me in a warm welcome to John Gizzi of Newsmax. I accept the nomination. <laughs> it is such a pleasure. Here we go again. I'm up here and you're out there and it's morning at PLC. It, it always seems that I'm here in the morning and you always turn out. It's just heartwarming. And I like this format for one reason and one reason alone. I get to see my old friends in person, and if they disagree with me or they don't understand something, they can talk about it after, as one friend to another. In the age of Zoom calls and Skypes and, of course, WhatsApp and texts and emails, it's a pleasure to see people one-on-one. -on -one. And there's no misunderstandings either. You know, misunderstanding has become the great excuse 
in this age of mass communication. It reminds me of a story told to me by the late Secretary of State, Alexander Haig. He recalled a friend of his, a French general named Pierre, that he met through NATO. Pierre was retired at 70 years old. His wife, Marie, was 59. One day, Marie went to her doctors, and to her shock, she discovered she was pregnant. She immediately called the officer's club where Pierre was playing cribbage with the boys. He picked up the phone. Hello? And she said, you old goat. You know what you went and did? You got me pregnant. And there was a pause, and Pierre said, who's calling, please? When I was a kid, when I was a kid, I hated people who said when I was a kid. Now I say it all the time. When I was a young reporter, I came to the first Pennsylvania Leadership Conference. It was an incredible event to see all these activists gathering together, talking in a civil fashion, and discussing the issues and personalities of the day on the right. It was also a very different PLC from today's and a different conservative movement. To look back at it, the issues were different. I was on a panel on the issue of government intrusion in private lives and private business. There was a lady on the panel named Helen Waverly. Maybe some of you remember her. She ran a small business in her home in which she made baskets that you'd give to your mom or your sweetheart as a present. She felt she had complied with all the rules in the Keystone State, but it wasn't so. And as a result, the state shut her business down completely because she violated zoning laws, having a business in a residential area. The issue of cutting taxes across the board was sacrosanct. It was not a question of whether taxes would be cut or not, but just how many taxes would be cut, how many tax rates would be lowered, and whether taxes would be eliminated. And in terms of personalities, George H.W. Bush had only been president for a few months, but already those gathered here in Harrisburg for the PLC were beginning to question whether he was truly the heir to the mantle of Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was the gold standard in those days for us guys. Now, right now that was then, this is now. The fact is that the issues, the personalities, the conservative movement itself has changed. How often do you hear people say to you, it's not Ronald Reagan's conservative movement, just as they say it's not Reagan's Republican Party. Well, when you do that, may I make a suggestion? Simply say, you're right, it isn't. The fact is that personalities change, times change, and of course, the issues change as well. Reagan himself was very different from the earlier political hero of some of us guys, Barry Goldwater. And in turn, both Reagan and Goldwater differed from a great conservative leader before and after World War II, Senator Robert Taft of Ohio. The fact is that times do change and the issues do change. And let's take a look at that. The issues today, well, Law and order. This is something we hear about all the time, from Washington County to Washington, D.C. And there is an outbreak of crime, a rise in lawlessness, and people want our law enforcement officials to crack down on crime hard. The question is, does that interfere with the state and localities tradition? of overseeing law enforcement around the country. In addition, immigration is an issue of critical importance these days. 
and immigration, one has to ask, will the federal government do its job of enforcing the law? As the late Congressman Sonny Bono of California used to say, well, if it's illegal immigration, then just enforce the law and do what's legal. In addition, we have to also consider that if the federal government doesn't do its job, do we then turn to state officials such as Texas Governor Greg Abbott and let him pass <laughs> legislation such as SB4 to allow law enforcement officials to find those who are in the country illegally and in some cases deport them or keep them out? That's a big question and a big issue. Trade. We used to all agree that free trade was the best solution to the area of international commerce. Mm -hmm. Well, that's true, but free trade has to be fair trade first. And hence one sees the call for more tariffs and the rising cheers for conservative candidates in the union hall. In the area of foreign policy, well, since the end of the Cold War, we have had an ongoing debate about whether there should be non-interventionism or an aggressive interventionism in the post-Cold War world. It's not an easy question, and situations have to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. Well, let's look at it. We don't face a monolithic enemy of communism anymore. We face individual countries who dislike us, Russia, China, North Korea, Laos, and of course, the Ayatollahs in Iran and his goons in Gaza and his lackeys in Lebanon, all emboldened by a common denominator, a hatred of all things that are Western. We see this in many different forms. In Taiwan, where I'm going in May, people live under threat from a colossus neighbor, very hostile to them, only 90 miles away. We see it in Russia in its onslaught two years ago against Ukraine, part of a 14-year pattern. And we saw it in the Middle East last fall. On October 7th, 2023, Simply put, the hand that held the dagger plunged it into the back of its neighbor. Well, what do we do about it? Next week, when Congress returns, it's going to take up a measure of aid to Ukraine and very possibly to Israel as well. I'm not going to take sides on it, but I want you to consider something, and that is perpetual behavior of someone. Vladimir Putin, since the year 2008, has pursued a policy of hegemony unknown in Europe since the end of World War II. It started in 08 with the seizure of a province known as Ossetia in the sovereign nation of Georgia. It continued in 2014 when he seized Crimea in five days. And now it goes on with the war that's raging in Ukraine right now. I would say simply put, if you don't believe that someone's got to do something to stop him, he'll come back again and again. Maybe not next week, next month, or in a year, but I assure you he'll be coming back. He's got to be stopped. Now, I think overall we know that times do change and a new conservative approach has to be brought up. Few could say it as well as a Midwestern Republican congressman in 1858. The quiet dogmas of the quiet past are just not suitable to the turbulent problems of today. That congressman was Abraham Lincoln. Now, 
let's talk a little politics. I don't know about you, but I get polls brought to me all the time. Have you ever noticed that people are citing the polls and what the polls say as if how the attitudes of voters today are important to what they do when they go to the polls, the real polls, that is, in November. Quite frankly, I always used to say there were only two polls I absolutely trusted, Lech Fuenza and John Paul. <laughs> Ipsos. The international pollster just came out with a poll of Frenchmen. What they do immediately after having sex. 10% said they do it again. 15% said they smoke a cigarette. And 75% said they go home to their wives. Well, Yes, let's talk a little politics. The House of Representatives is in a situation in which 52 members of both parties have decided to retire, seek another office, or um, simply resign, notably the former Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy. That makes it very uncertain in the prediction of the outcome of an election in which only three seats currently separate one party from the other, the closest division in the House since 1930. This reporter's prediction is that given this uncertainty with so many retirements, given the fact that redistricting in some states, something that should have been completed uh, three years ago, is finally done, and in New York, Democrats gained only one seat under the new lines that were laid out. In North Carolina, Republicans could gain as many as four seats. Well, this reporter predicts that the House of Representatives will be as tight and as uncertain when the election is over as it is today. In the United States Senate, well, the current breakdown, as most of you know, is 51 Democrats to 49 Republicans. Actually, that's 48 Democrats and three independents who vote with Democrats for control of the Senate. How will this shape up? West Virginia is already a done deal. Republicans will pick up the seat, and then Republicans have opportunities to win in Michigan in Montana, Nevada, Ohio, and oh yes, Pennsylvania, where Bob Casey is facing the race of his life. <laughs> Republicans should be cautiously optimistic that they're going to pick up the Senate. On the presidential race, let me note something. Recently, I completed a book by historian Irvin Gelman, who lives in Pennsylvania, the campaign of the century, about the 1960 election. I also watched the second Kennedy-Nixon debate on Google. You can get anything on Google. And that was just an experience to watch. People actually kept to the time that the moderator told them to keep to. <laughs> they answered questions directly, and there was never a scintilla of personal comment in the debate not even mentioning their wives and children. It was policy, and it was a, an intellectual feast, an historical feast, for people like Paul Kanger, who love history and policy. <laughs> the median age was the youngest in American history ever for candidates who were nominated by major parties for the highest office in the land. And of course, there was the historic significance of the first debate. Let's fast forward ahead to today. We have the oldest median age of candidates in history. And in all likelihood, there will be no televised debates this year. 
So it's a vast uncertainty ahead of us regarding the election. I couldn't predict how the market will be, whether interest rates will go up or down. I have a feeling they're going to go down, but let's see. Or what the international situation will be at the time. I will say that the turnout will exceed that of 2020. And that was the highest turnout in an election in 96 years. And the outcome, as it was the last two times, will be very, very close. Now, it's always a pleasure for me to be here at PLC. It means a lot to come here. And I'm always moved by one thing in particular. PLC brings together disparate groups of conservatives. Economic conservatives argue with cultural conservatives. Traditional conservatives are arguing with the MAGA crowd, the Tea Partiers, and more recent incarnations of them. And the libertarians, well, they argue with just about everybody. <laughs> but what inevitably happens, and has happened low these 35 years, is that conservatives in the end, stay friends. They sit down together for breakfast. They listen to me. And they all leave in a very good mood when it's done. In effect, people who come to PLC follow the admonition of the late playwright Rod Serling, creator of The Twilight Zone, who said, for civilization to survive, we must all be civil. That makes a lot of sense. And that speaks volumes about PLC. Therefore, let us leave together as friends, as conservatives of different stripes, but as conservatives, and go forward, remembering the words of the late Green Bay Packers coach, Vince Lombardi, that we can never achieve perfection. But if we, at least if we strive for perfection, we'll reach excellence. This you will do. As PLC activists, you can do no less. Thank you, I love you, God bless you all. That's wonderful, isn't he something? Yeah. Truly, truly a legend in our midst and in our time. Well, we're now going to discuss the current state of the conservative movement. And John is going to be joined, or is joined, by Paul Kenger of Grove City College, and by, yay! And by Jeffrey Lloyd, a former television newsman at CNN, now on Newsmax TV, a local resident and a real favorite of the PLC audience. Uh, and somebody who we need to listen to as much as we can. I will be the first to admit I don't watch enough Newsmax TV. I am going to come back from this PLC with a personal pledge to myself to watch more of it because these are voices we need to hear. Paul Kenger has been at Grove City for 27 years. He has written 20 books. He is one of the world's most knowledgeable experts on the phenomenon of Ronald Reagan. And in general, he has his pulse not only on the history of the conservative movement, but also the current state of it from the perspective of the college campus. That's a voice we need to hear and we need to understand. Uh, Jeff Lloyd, as noted earlier, has been a journalist in and around the conservative movement for basically his entire career. He has been inside government. He has worked directly on campaigns. He has worked within uh, an administration, and he has worked as an independent journalist. He is a great observer of what is happening in the conservative movement generally. So I'd like you to welcome uh, all three of them, the two of them who have just joined us, and we'll begin our discussion in just a moment. So my first question is to all three of you gentlemen. John talked about some of the history 
of the conservative movement. He's the only one in the room, I think, that could go back to Robert Taft, but several of us, <laughs> se several, several of, of us at least have studied and remembered uh, Barry Goldwater. I was a college freshman uh, in that year, and I remember uh, standing out like an odd thumb at the very beginning of my college career by being a Goldwater supporter on a ca campus where I think the Goldwater su supporters could have all met in a phone booth. <laughs> for those of you who remember what a phone booth is. <laughs> Pretty good. Like but <clears throat> whether it's from Reagan or from Goldwater forward, or you want to talk about some of the other influences on the conservative movement, like William F. Buckley, uh, some of the other intellectual foundations, as John indicated, it is typically a set of issues and principles that has characterized the conservative movement. And various people have come along at various times and become the standard bearer, the personification, the face of some of those issues. And even though Ronald Reagan only had one job, one political job before he became president, everyone else had had multiple, some appointed, some elected, but they were all familiar with the political world. Ronald Reagan was governor for two terms of the largest state in the union, so he had an opportunity in eight years to pick up a lifetime's worth of experience. So they all came along as the standard bearers for the set of issues which was considered the basic set of the conservative movement. Some people referred to the three-legged stool, which had to do with economic conservative, uh, conservatism. The whole idea of smaller government is one leg. Another leg is a strong military, robust foreign policy. And the third leg is the set of family issues, uh, life, uh, and so on. What we've seen with, Ron, with uh, Donald Trump is quite different. He is truly a phenomenon. He did not hold any political position. He never ran for election until he ran for election to the highest office in the land. One could argue that he comes to the conservative movement not as its issue-based standard bearer, but rather as a unique and distinctive personality who has adopted some of those issues. So I would like each of our three panelists to address the question of the phenomenon of Donald Trump this way. How has he affected the conservative movement? How is the conservative movement of 2024 different than the conservative movement of 20, up to say 2015 before uh, his arrival uh, at at the foot of the golden escalator in, in Trump Tower. How has he affected the conservative movement? And in particular, I want to hear from Paul about how he has affected it on a college campus. Gentlemen, have at it. Let's start with Paul and then work your way <coughs> down. Paul, Jeff, and then John. Yeah, thank you, Colin. And it's great to be back with uh, Jeff and John. I really, we, we really look forward to this every year, even though it's so damned early in the morning. We, uh, we, we, we don't you have early morning to... classes at Grove City? <laughs> I don't. Afternoon <laughs> classes. Afternoon <laughs> classes. Yeah, it's, that's... <laughs> but, um, in fact, one of, one of the courses I'm teaching this semester currently, at 1 o'clock, that's when my classes start. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah, p.m. And, and it's on conservatism, so I, I, I should be well briefed to, uh, to answer this question. But uh, it, it, conservatism really shouldn't change, and that, that's really the whole point of the conservative philosophy. And, and if you want to go through, I won't, I won't try to go through a long history of the movement, but two intellectual founders of the movement, even before Buckley and before Reagan, would be Russell Kirk, Russell Kirk uh, right. who wrote the, the Roots of American Order, um, and, and he wrote the 50s, 60s, died in 1994, died about 30 years ago. 
and even further back, Edmund Burke, who was, uh, who was a member of the British Parliament from the late 1700s. And, and Burke talked about this eternal contract between, between the dead, the living, and the yet to be born, right? And there was this understanding of basic values, principles, what T.S. Eliot called the first principles, the permanent things. Mm. Russell Kirk said it is an enduring moral order. So conservatives believe in an enduring moral order. Reagan would have defined conservatism around issues, um, like Holland just said, um, freedom, faith, family, limited government, peace through strength, which is, which is kind of a foundational belief of conservatives, right? That the way to have peace is to, have, is to be strong in the first place, that way you don't have to use that military strength. Reagan said, John mentioned earlier Putin and the Russians. Reagan said, we learned long ago that when you're talking to the Russians, negotiating with the Russians, you had to approach them with a dove of peace in one hand and a sword in the other, right? So you, you could only work with them from a position of strength. So those are all basically foundational issues, ideas, principles. And for Donald Trump, it, 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 he, he doesn't come into the movement as an, as an intellectual, right? Um, he probably doesn't know who Burke and Kirk were, right? Um, he, he, but he comes into it probably, and Jeff, you'd probably agree with me more on this, maybe, maybe a kind of more populist conservatism, perhaps, right? Certain basic um, beliefs in certain core American values, patriotism, love of country, uh, certainly limited government, small government, free market economics. And I'm, and I'm really pleased to say, and I think when we did this probably five or six years ago, longer than that, 2016, I would have said then, and I did, ba I did say this back then, I didn't think in any way Donald Trump would be a cultural or social or moral conservative, especially on issues like abortion, for example. But he ended up be, being the best pro-life president we ever had. Mm. Uh, there's, there's, there's no question about it. And it, it, it was really, really kind of stunning. I, I mean, you know, Ronald Reagan could have probably articulated the position better, but Reagan uh, gave us three appointees, Supreme Court appointees. You guys want to name them? Yeah. Go for it. Kennedy. Kennedy, disaster. Absolute disaster. And we all remember Justice Bork. Bork. Bork didn't make it through. And, <laughs> no, and, and Kennedy got the Bork Sandra Day O'Connor. Sandra Day O'Connor. Sandra Day O'Connor. And, and William Rehnquist. And William, yeah. Well, After Rehn elevating right. yeah, Rehnquist to Chief naming Antonin Scalia. Scalia. So Reagan was one out of three, basically. And certainly on issues, I mean, Kennedy and and, and, uh, and, and uh, Sandra Day O'Connor were terrible on the life issues. In fact, Reed Kennedy's so-called mystery clause in his uh, Casey v. Planned Parenthood decision that upheld Roe v. Wade. Trump gave you the three who overturned Roe v. Wade um, and Planned Parenthood v. Casey. In fact, Justice Alito said, you know, as of this day, both uh, Roe and Casey are, are, are overturned. So Trump on Supreme Court picks was uh, three for three. And remember, remember the, the Amy Coney Barrett pick? I mean, that came right at the end of the term, almost. And there were people, even on our side, this gets to what Dinesh was saying last night, who were trying to play by the rules of the left and saying, well, maybe you shouldn't appoint anybody just right <laughs> now. And MSNBC and the New York Times don't want you to. The liberals are going to be mad if you do that. They're going to be angry. He said, well, too bad. And, and so he named Amy Coney Barrett anyway. But, uh, but so on Trump, I'm giving a long answer to your question. I should just, just go to Jeff here next. Yeah. I think it's more of a kind of populist conservatism. I even call it kind of like a Midwest conservatism, although he's a New Yorker through and through and through. Um, and strong on defense and, and limited government, free market economics. Um, patriotism, and surprisingly good on, on cultural, moral, social issue, issues, uh, surprising to me. I, I didn't expect that. He's been better on that than I thought. Well, I have, I have to say, having worked for President Reagan, I went back when Donald Trump started running to look at what was being said about Ronald Reagan in the day and found all of these people uh, Republican establishment figures of the day, 
saying literally that Ronald Reagan was an extremist. Right. That if, if he were ever to be nominated, it could be the end of the Republican Party. End of the world. End of the world. <laughs> I mean, we're talking about people like then Vice President Nelson Rockefeller, Illinois Senator Charles Percy, on and on and on went the list. And uh, Page one of the New York Times. Yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly. And I remember reading an article in 1965, if you recall the story, on October 27th of 1964, Ronald Reagan gave uh, a speech which became, uh, sort of propelled him into the political world uh, on behalf of Barry Goldwater. And uh, in 1965, the New York Times ran a front page story saying that the California Republican establishment was absolutely panicked because they thought, my God, he's really going to run for governor of California and we're going to get clobbered. As it turned out, he won in a million vote landslide. Mm -hmm you know, message there. And by the time we got to Donald Trump, I remember I was, uh, uh, I sat down with him, the first time I met him was in 2013, and I interviewed him for the American Spectator. And we talked and talked and talked and talked. And I thought to myself, wow, you know, th this is really a conservative guy here and uh, if he ever does run, I think he could win. And of course, I, I put this in print. Yes, Trump can win. My friends thought I had absolutely <laughs> lost my mind. And uh, I, I sort of stuck with it. And uh, by I, the time- I thought you had lost your mind. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. And uh, he, he, once he was nominated and everything, uh, and I was on CNN, and uh, he loved the fact that I always compared him to Ronald Reagan. Mm. And I did so because I thought, you know, they're, they're both outsiders to the political establishment. And Donald Trump may not have spent uh, a lifetime in the conservative movement, but he was, to my way of thinking, indeed conservative. So it was, it was good to, you know, to talk to him about this. And he, he was... Uh, <laughs> I, I always laugh when I think about this story the first time I met him in person. And I go to Trump Tower and you know they take me up to his office and we sit there and everything. And then we're gonna fly to Washington for an American Spectator dinner at which the attractions were he and Ted Cruz. Oh. And so we're, we go down the elevator and there's like a back lobby to, uh, the Trump Tower main public lobby, which has all these stores and restaurants that all tied to him. So we're headed out the door. I can see the limo out there waiting for us. And he says, we're gonna take my citation. Al Gorzo was giving me grief about the 757. We're gonna take my citation. It'll get us there faster. 28 minutes. So we're starting to walk out there. And he says, oh, wait, wait, Jeff, come with me. Takes me by the arm. We go into the main lobby, and my political brain instantly realizes he's literally swarmed hmm. with you know, the tourists in there, and they all recognize him. Oh, Mr. Trump, oh, Donald, can I have a selfie? All this kind of thing. I thought, wow, this is, this is pretty amazing. <coughs> he takes me over to a men's tie counter. They're all Trump ties. <laughs> I had looked at them. I had looked at them when I came in and thought maybe I'll get one and then saw that the price was something like 80 bucks a tie. I thought, thanks, but no thanks. I am not Donald Trump. Well, so he takes me over there and says, pick one. I said, no, no, pick one. I said, okay, that one. He says, pick another. <laughs> oh, no, pick another. I pick a second one. And then he turns to the girl behind the counter and says, okay, and give him that one and give him that one. <laughs> and, and then he points, he points to a shelf up above and says, oh yeah, and give him one of those. One of those was men's cologne, success by Trump. <laughs> <laughs> but you couldn't, you couldn't make it up. And so we, we get on the plane and, and we're flying to Washington and we're getting ready to land 
and we're sitting across from each other, and he says, I, I, I've got to go comb my hair. Oh. And, and, and he sits down, he says, you know, I don't get the fascination with the hair. Barbara Walters wants to touch my hair. <laughs> Greta Van Susteren wants to touch my hair. And he goes like this, and it's decidedly his hair. And he, he goes like this, pulls it back, he says, you know, I'm worth $10 billion. Don't you think with that much money, if this were a toupee, I couldn't get a better one? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I have to say, I, I really think that, that not unlike Ronald Reagan, he has made a real impact on this country. And uh, as we're saying here, he, he got those justices confirmed, uh, and I knew it. I thought that he would be able to deliver. And I don't think we're done with that story yet. So I'll turn it back to Colin. John, follow up, please. Thank I, you, Jeff. Thank you very much. I might add as a postscript, or should I say by way of disclosure, um, I was one of those who never believed Donald Trump could be nominated for president. And at the 2015 PLC, I got up and said exactly why, and I was followed by Jeffrey Lord, <laughs> who told me why I didn't know I was, what I was talking about. That day. Politely. Politely. Um, two things that should be noted uh, in the analogies of Reagan and Trump. First of all, when Ronald Reagan made that speech that Jeff mentioned, A Time for Choosing, mm -hmm. in October of 1964, uh, he essentially said everything that Barry Goldwater was being pilloried for, including the idea of making Social Security voluntary, if you want it, and of privatizing the Tennessee Valley Authority. Yeah. And yet, he received rave reviews. It brought in the most donations for any speech uh, that was done, and some Goldwater biographers have said it was the best thing that happened to the campaign, possibly the only good thing that happened in the general election. And of course, it launched his career in the same sense that William Jennings Bryan's Cross of Gold speech right. launched him to the presidential nomination of his party. Uh, that was pretty amazing at the time. And one thing was that Reagan was a familiar fixture. He had hosted a weekly television series, two in fact, for an aggregate 16 years. When he decided to run for governor of California, a poll showed 83% of the Golden State's voters knew him. And he had a very positive response from voters, even though they didn't know his stands on the issues. Fast forward to Donald Trump running, and I never realized this, but Jeff touched on it. Um, he had had a prize-winning television show, an Emmy-winning television show, for more than 10 years, which was very popular. The Apprentice and it evolved into The Celebrity Apprentice and other formats. And he was quite known, and hence you would see people wanting a selfie, wanting his autograph. I never made the connection, but I have a friend who is a French journalist with La Figaro, Laura Mandeville, who decided to write a book on Trump, and she made this comparison that like Ronald Reagan, he was liked by people across the political spectrum because they saw him on TV and liked his program and his persona. And I might add that that book came out the week that Trump was elected president, and it became a bestseller, and uh, it was the first European biography of Donald Trump, and saw it coming. The effect for the future. Ronald Reagan reached across party lines. He was the first, and I think Paul has noted this, the first former union member ever to become president. He was president of the Screen Actors Guild, a card-carrying member of the AFL-CIO, and uh, that certainly was an entree for him to bring blue-collar voters along. Donald Trump has continued this. There's no Reagan Democrats anymore because they've mostly become Republicans. But Donald Trump has reached out to other groups, to current actual Democrats and union members, 
doing so on the issue of trade primarily, but certainly on other issues where he's connected. And we are seeing the Teamsters and other unions seriously discussing an endorsement of Donald Trump. I might add, that would be only the first time since 1972 that the Teamsters have given their endorsement to a Republican. And I believe they've done it overall um, three times. And that would be a pretty historic moment and a blow to Biden and the Democrats. Similarly, I watched Donald Trump speak to an all-black audience in South Carolina, and he definitely connected. And he made a comparison. He said, Joe Biden brags in his book about working with Democratic segregationists in the Senate. I've worked with black people all my life to help them get good paying jobs and to start their own businesses. Mm -hmm. And he pointed out, and the New York Times has written about this, he said, anyone remember Mitt Romney? And of course the audience all booed. He said, he got 4% of the black vote. I got 16% and polls show me now getting 20% and more sometimes, up to 28. And then he paused and thought aloud, as Donald Trump frequently does, and said, 28% of the black vote. We don't even need to have an election if that's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, polls show the Hispanic vote. Younger, entrepreneurial, Hispanic, or, you know, third generation of the families who are now voting, they, like him, up to 40% of the vote, and that would be the highest since George W. Bush's re-election in 04 for a Republican nominee. So when I said earlier, it's not your father's conservative movement, it isn't, and it's not your father's Republican Party either. Right. Just as Ronald Reagan changed it by bringing in new people, so does Donald Trump. By the it, way, if uh, Reagan, Reagan got only about 10% of the black vote, I mean, if Trump gets 20% of the black vote, it's over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's, um, I, I, th I think the, the problem with Donald Trump compared to Reagan, I was just looking at the Real Clear Politics uh, composite average just about an hour ago, and Trump leads Biden by 1.1%. And by the way, if Trump wins the overall popular vote, it's over. Uh, I mean, if he comes, if he was to lose to Biden the popular vote by about one or two percent, he'll probably win the Electoral College. Mm -hmm. If he if he gets more popular votes than Biden, it's it's over. But um, I think Trump has a ceiling of about 47 percent. Good news is Biden probably has a ceiling of about 46 or 47. <laughs> But Reagan got 60% of the vote, 59% uh, to be exact, in 84. And he beat Carter by 10% in 80. Mm. Reagan won 49 out of 50 states in, in 1984. So Reagan did have this much larger, broader likability that Trump simply doesn't have. But um, Trump doesn't need 59% to beat Biden. He needs about 47 and uh, as of right now, he's there. This is the first, I mean, he's been leading overall in the polls since about October. Mm -hmm. And he, I, he never had that kind of a sustained lead in the polls in 2016 or 2020. So if this holds up, um, he could probably win 300 electoral college votes. Wouldn't be even close. One postscript I'd add to what Paul said is that we're now just starting to discuss the impact of third party candidates right. in the yeah. race. RFK Jr. RFK Jr. I would have always guessed he would take votes from both candidates uh, if the nominees are Biden and Trump. Uh, on the other hand, others tell me who analyze the figures that Donald Trump, you are either going to vote for him or against him that no one has a choice and then say, well, he or she is not on the ballot, so I'll vote for Trump. Mm. Uh, with him, it's black and white. And that uh, any third party candidate would hurt Biden and not Trump. I might add, in 2016, the Libertarians did the best they ever did with a very impressive ticket of two former governors, and they got 3% of the vote. 
The next time around, they ran no one, and so there was no alter, or they ran an obscure candidate. Uh, Jill Stein ran on the Green Party ticket in 16. The Greens ran no one next time. And what that means is that uh, in contrast to 20, you are going to see next time substantial third party candidates, RFK Jr., Jill Stein, and the educator Cornell West. If, if RFK Jr. can get on enough states, but, but, he, but he could get 13% of the vote, and I think the, um, the Trump lead over Biden probably turns into a three-point lead. I, th I think RFK Jr. picking Nicole Shanahan was just a huge blessing for Trump. I mean, he, he didn't pick someone more moderate or maybe right-leaning or um, you know, somebody, they were talking about athletes, Jesse Ventura, Aaron Rodgers, not that Aaron Rodgers, Aaron Rodgers is gonna be playing football next year in New York. But of all people, he picked a, a lefty and that ends up hurting Biden. Collectively, collectively, the combination of all of those people helps Trump, without question. And, you know, thinking of Robert Kennedy, uh, you know, I always have to tell the story because it, it, it reminds me that Joe Biden is sloppy. He's not, uh, you know, he's not a concentrated thinker. His career... That's a nice way to put it. Civility, right, John? So, yeah. Rod so, Sterling. So I, I got to tell you this story. So uh, back there in 1988, well, when I, when I was 17 years old, I was a huge fan of Robert Kennedy's father, namesake father, Bobby Kennedy Sr. Right. And uh, when he died, tragically assassinated, my Nixon-loving mom got on a bus with me. We lived in Allentown. I was in high school. We went to New York City so I could stand in line for like two hours in the June sun to touch the casket at St. Oh. Patrick's Cathedral. Mm -hmm. wow. mm -hmm. And shortly thereafter, they started, uh, record companies started producing these long playing records of Robert Kennedy's speeches and the little geek that I was, I sat in my room for hours and memorized them. Hmm. Okay, flash ahead to September of 1987. I'm now a White House political director for President Reagan. We've just come through the tumultuous Robert Bork hearings, chaired by Joe Biden, who was also running for president. His opponent for the nomination, Governor Michael Dukakis, runs an ad that shows uh, the Labor Party leader in Britain, Neil Kinnock. Why am I, he was Welsh, why am I the first member of my family to have an education to do this, et cetera, et cetera. And then they stop it, freeze frame, and go to a Joe Biden speech. Why am I the first member of my family from Scranton to do, you know, coal miners, I mean, the whole thing. The first and, in a thousand generations. Yes, yes. So the Biden people respond with Biden saying, oh, it was just a mistake, I don't do this. <clears throat> this is where I uh, came in with my memory. It, back in February of that year, we'd had a snowstorm in Washington, and as everybody familiar with Washington knows, DC shuts down, people panic. Sure. I'm working in the White House, I live close at hand, so I go into my office, I'm the only person there, no phones ringing, nothing. I thought, well, what do I do? I turn on C-SPAN, and there is Joe Biden addressing the California Democratic Party convention. And I thought, well, I'll watch this. He's supposed to be a good speaker. So I'm sitting there, and suddenly I begin to realize I'm getting to the end of his sentences before he is. Oh, <laughs> How can this be? And I said out loud to myself, my God, he's plagiarizing from Bobby Kennedy. Yeah. <laughs> so that's February. We're now into September, and this whole Neil Kinnock thing comes up. And he says, oh, I don't do that. Just, I knew differently. So in a position to do something, I picked up the phone and called Maureen Dowd of the New York Times. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, told her, she says, you're kidding. Can, can you prove this? I said, sure, Maureen. I'll run home to Pennsylvania, get my Bobby Kennedy records out, and I'll have them in your office by Monday morning. Huh? I did. 
That was Monday. By Wednesday, there was a front page story in the New York Times. Referencing you. Referencing me, uh, saying that uh, Biden's speeches are drawing scrutiny, et cetera, and, and going through all this. Within a week after that, <laughs> he was out of the race. And my point is, what a dumb thing to do. I mean, Robert Kennedy Sr. was one of the most famous people in his day. To think that you could plagiarize from him and no one would notice right. is just not, you know. So They might miss Neil Kinnock, but, yeah. not, but not Robert right, F. Kennedy. Right. Yeah, right. yeah. So, I, you know, my only point is this is the mindset of the guy who's sitting there in the White House. He is not the sharpest knife in the drawer. <laughs> and... Uh, could contrast that with Donald Trump, uh, and I think we've got uh, a, a very good chance here. Jeff, I'd love you to follow up that wonderful anecdote with your own analysis of what I call the death of journalism. The whole concept yeah. of journalism as a profession, as opposed to the 19th century with so-called yellow journalism, where, where every newspaper, every media organ was solidly in one camp and would just rip to shreds the other and it was filled with inaccuracies and so on. The journalistic profession decided to elevate itself, create schools of journalism, talk about balance, talk about integrity, all of those things. Now it seems that we have slipped back into the 19th century model of journalism. What is it like to be a journalist today in a profession that has basically abandoned its ideals. Well, I have, I have to laugh. I have a column coming out later today at Newsbusters. And I'm answering uh, a guy named Chris Quinn, who is the uh, editorial editor uh, of the Cleveland Plain Dealer. Mm. And he wrote a, he wrote a piece uh, chastising Trump supporters for accusing him in the paper of being anti-Trump and biased and all this kind of thing. And, and he goes on at length that we have to speak truth to power and that we are uh, unbiased and we just say the facts. And of course, all the facts are that, in their view, that Donald Trump is a terrible human being and yada, yada, yada. So I, I, I wrote this piece and I said, this, this guy, he actually says, in there that we're about truth. And, and truth is our true north. And I said, whoa, here, you're so biased, you don't even get it. Yeah, right. you, can't, you can't see it. And you, you are not you know, objective about all of this. And you make quite plain in your article that you can't stand Donald Trump. I said, OK, fine, just be honest about it. Don't pretend or that you are. Or label it as opinion. Yeah, yes. Not journalism. Right. right. And, and what they do is, you know, they run these stories. And it's, it's one thing if you've got an opinion piece on the editorial page or the op-ed page or the New York Times or wherever. But it's another thing when your front page right. stories exactly. are all tilted in one direction. And that is what has happened. And they don't seem to even notice. It's like they're, they're genuinely oblivious. Yes. It's like, no, what do you mean? They, 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 they don't even get it. They really don't. Uh, it, we've got three minutes left. I'd love to focus on the future for just a moment and ask Paul what it's like on your campus. Now, Grove City is generally a conservative and Christian campus, so it's likely to be uh, different than, say, the Ivy League campuses of today. But nonetheless, it's a new generation with new perspectives. What is the feel, the tone and tenor of the Grove City campus insofar as the 2024 presidential election is concerned? Well, I mean, we're totally different, right? I mean, so we're an outlier compared to the other campuses. I mean, we're doing, um, we're doing a conference next week on anti-Semitism and uh -huh. focusing on October 7th, and Vice President Mike Pence is coming in. And I wow, mean, there's good, no, there's no pro-Hamas demonstrations on our <laughs> campus, right? So, so we're, we're, very, we're very, very different. We're kind of like a shining city on a hill in education, right? To quote from, from, from Ronald Reagan. Um, I, I'd say generally though, campuses across the country, I mean, we're in big trouble. 
Um, one, one demographic I would point out, and we only have two and a half minutes, so I can't really go into this, but there's a major shift going on right now with a lot of young people. You know, our generation, you were supposed to go to college, right? right. That's really changing now, and, and especially with young men, mm. all right? And young men don't want any of this woke BS. They, you know, they don't, they don't like the DEI stuff. And they're going, they're going to trade schools. They're going into the military, yeah. and now the vast majority, and it's continued to increase, um, people in college are women. It didn't need the ERA for this to happen. This just happened naturally. More women in medical school, law school. So um, that's a big demographic change going on in colleges. In and Yeah, and, and it's going to, unfortunately, politically speaking, it's going to continue to make guys, I think this is good, right, more conservative. But it's going to make women more liberal, and it's going to, you know, kind of like the young white woke woman, yeah. right, on, on the college campuses. And uh, my friend Scott McKay, who writes with us at the American Spectator, talks about how it's also creating a marriage problem between young guys and young girls uh, because because they they're so t in totally different universes politically, ideologically, that um, they're not getting married. So uh, there, there's, uh, these things are going on. When they have a minute left, I better stop there. But Grove City College is blessedly totally different than all the others. That's why well, I teach there. That's, that's a, <laughs> a note of optimism. Our time has run out. Uh, I want to thank everyone. We could go on for another hour. Yeah. Maybe next year we can get Loman to extend uh, the period of time. But, uh, <laughs> but not earlier. Thank you. I know, I know John's got something else he wants to add right here at the end. I just want to thank you all, and I'll let you, I'll let you go on past where the red stop sign shows up, John. All but right. let's express our appreciation to Paul, to Jeff, and to John. Thank you. Thank you. You've got the last word, John. One thing to keep your eye on, uh, it'll be interesting to watch the Libertarian Party, whether... In the name of ballot access and publicity, they give Robert Kennedy Jr., yeah. who is in no way, shape, or form a libertarian, their nomination, or stay with a lesser-known figure who nonetheless shares the leave-me-alone principles of the Libertarian Party, which has been on the ballot in just about every state since John Hospers was the candidate mm -hmm. in 1972. One other thing, uh, Colin mentioned this in his introduction of me. I had the great pleasure of personally seeing the first libertarian ever elected president anywhere sworn into office when I went to Buenos Aires December 8th and watched Javier Millet, one-term congressman, television pundit, all be sworn in as president of Argentina. <laughs> And now he has to unearth 80 years of statism and government spending that began when Juan Perón came to power in 1944. And he's doing it. It's going to take a while, but um, 70,000 government employees let go. Programs to subsidize them when they're not working being eliminated. Now, he has some bigger ideas, including dollarizing the peso. In other words, using the U.S. dollar to, as the standard for the currency in Argentina. That will take a vote of the Argentinian Congress proposed by the left. John, are you going to be writing about this where we can read it? In Newsmax, in Newsmax. I wrote about it and one postscript. I interviewed a lot of people. I did man on the street interviews, or woman on the street, uh, senor and senorita on the street, for Newsmax television when I was there. And what's interesting is that the younger people and professional people understand what he's doing and that things will have to get worse before they get better, and they're supportive of it. And that is something to look at and uh, someone who is fearless and doesn't care what people think of him, um, 
Be interesting is to watch. Be interesting to Speaking watch. Speaking of watching, everyone in this room should begin regularly to watch Newsmax TV. Oh. Watch. And, and, read, and read the American read News Spectator. Max and also read the American Spectator. Yes. And you won't, you won't recognize John until you see his hat. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks again. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, gentlemen. what happens a lot of them a lot of them run out real quick to the but we've held the crowd pretty good all day yesterday This is the thing. Give me the, give me the hand <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our master of ceremonies for today's program, Rose Tennant, host of Rose Unplugged and frequent guest hostess for Sean Hannity. Please welcome to the stage, Rose. Hi, uh, has this been, you know what's interesting is every year I tell Loman, this was the best ever. And then the next year comes and this seems to be the best ever. Am I right? It's just, so, it's been so much fun. Great speakers, great panels. So thank you, Loman, for everything that you've been doing. Um, also, I want to talk to you guys about lunch. They asked me to discuss lunch with you. It is at 11 o'clock. It will be from 11 until 11.30. And then at 11.30, we have the Georgia former U.S. Senator David Perdue. He has nothing to do with chickens. Just want you to know that. He'll be joining us at 11.30. So make sure you're here for that. It should be very interesting. But right now, I'd like to uh, introduce to you a retired health care executive, small business owner, community volunteer, wife and mother. She's a credentialed firearms instructor under several organizations, and her company, Armed and Feminine, LLC was established in 2015 to bring the world of firearms training to women and has trained nearly 3,000 women and youth. She's active in advocacy for the education of the Second Amendment as the Pennsylvania State Director and Northeast Regional Director of Women for Gun Rights. Please welcome Kelly Pigeon. Good morning. Yeah, I know it takes a lot of courage to wear bright pink pants. You are correct, especially in this crowd. I'm um, going to wait for the guy to put my screen up, or do I do that? Ah, there we go. Do we have any gun owners in the crowd? Yay! You didn't raise your hand. You're not old enough, that's why. All righty. Um, so when I was asked to present about the Second Amendment, I thought, yeah, I could talk for a month about that. And he's like, well, no, you have 15 minutes. And so I thought I would sort of just steer this to the political election year type of, of presentation. So Second Amendment, let me see if I get this right. If we break it down, um, 27 words that I think every American should know, as well as the Pledge of Allegiance. To me, it is that important. Um, you can read it there. I know somebody's there counting to see if it really is 27 words. It is. 
well-regulated militia. You know, there is a bill right now in Congress to stop people from training with their guns because they think it's about forming a militia. No kidding. Well-regulated means to be well-trained, well-disciplined, and well-armed, should we need that to happen. Yeah, so even a bunch of ladies training on a range might be construed as being a militia. All righty. Being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people. Now, let's, a lot of these are going to come later in the presentation. The right of the people. Make note that it does not say the right of the citizens. This says the right of the people. To keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, a lot of really big two-way advocates, you know, they always say, we'll not be infringed, we'll not be infringed, right? And while that is important and it happens all the time, to me, the second one being necessary to the security of a free state is really the most powerful line. And in about 11 minutes, you're going to see why. So anytime that 2 eight cases come in front of the Supreme Court, pretty much we don't lose. We've been holding our breath um, since 2020 for the Bruin case to come out. These were the milestones that we've had. The Heller case, um, Dick Heller, it's, it's just, you know, first and foremost, like, yay, Dick Heller. He's actually come to speak at one of our events uh, this month here in New Jersey. That said that you can own a commonly owned firearm in your home. Well, that commonly owned is, is being defined every single day with the assault type weapons, right? Then came the McDonald case that said, since Heller, this is now going to apply to the states nationwide. But Bruin was huge. In 2022, this came out. And it was the New York Rifle, State Rifle Association who brought this case. And this decision came down and said, yes, the people have a right to carry a gun outside the home. While Heller said you can have a gun in your home, Bruin said you may now carry your gun outside the home. So the courts decided that they had to send a pile of cases back down to the states to reevaluate what they had gotten wrong the first time around. Um, I truly believe Josh Prince is in the back. You can give me best two-way attorney in Pennsylvania. There you go. Uh, he can give me a lowdown here on, I think this is going to lead to constitutional carry. I don't want to be the person who tests it because the United States versus pigeon does not have a really good ring to it, um, but it's great. And so when Bruin, the Bruin decision came down, the left lost its mind. Lost its mind. Crazy. You're going to allow everybody to have guns and kill everybody. But then it went away a few days later because what happened after that? Roe v. Wade was overturned like in the same week. <laughs> Their minds were blown even more. It was just like the worst day for them. So uh, Clarence Thomas, who wrote this opinion, said, um, basically, the Second Amendment is not a second-class right, and there is no other constitutional right that basically you need a permit for, you need the government's permission for, so why should we need one for this? All righty. Um, just to add to that, in the Bruin case, um, the Women for Gun Rights at the time was DC Project Foundation um, actually had its amicus brief cited in the opinion from Justice Alito. Pretty big stuff. So let's talk about gun ownership in the United States. You can look at the numbers. Lots of guns owned by lots of people, right? Um, Dave McCormick stole a lot of my thunder yesterday and then Dinesh did too. I'm like, great, now what am I going to talk about? The boys took all my stuff. But anyway, the number one reason, and what Dave said is, you know, the increase in gun ownership. The number one reason, personal protection. When people are scared, they buy guns. Let me say that again. When people are scared, they buy guns. I didn't make it part of my presentation because I had an afterthought, so I need my spectacles here, and i got to talk really quick. March of 2020, what happened? COVID, that's right. 37 million background checks were conducted by the NICS system. Records, crashed records when COVID came. People are scared. The next biggest one, December of 2020. What was so important about December of 2020? We lost the election, right? 
people are scared. Four million, and then the January following, 4.3 million more background checks were done. Absolutely insane, because people are scared in uncertainty, they buy guns. So if anybody's here from the Pittsburgh area, and this happens in a lot of municipalities, hello, no, you're not gonna have any police coverage from 3 a.m. until the morning. And so, unless there's something in progress, you're your own first responder. What are you gonna do? You're gonna buy a gun. Women, that's us, woohoo! Right? Growing, huge. In 2020, COVID, millions of women went out and bought guns for the very first times in their lives. And look, they're very involved. Women can save the Second Amendment. What, what, what mothers believe, their children will believe. And women can save the Second Amendment. I gotta get this moving here. Fastest growing demographic and also for concealed carry. Gun ownership by race. Everybody owns them. Gun ownership by political view. I will add that the Women for Gun Rights is a nonpartisan organization because the Second Amendment applies to everybody, not just conservatives. Guns should not be political, but here we are, right? First thing that happens in every election. Regardless of who you are, what you believe, you still have that right. But it's an election year, and what happens in every election year? I will tell you, as a, as a professional trainer, my business is insane, exponentially increases in election years, because what do they do in election years? We're coming after your guns. We're coming after your guns. When people are scared, they buy guns. So election years are huge. This is what we see right now from the federal and at our state levels here about the different uh, bills that are out there. Notice the disparity between pro-gun legislation and anti-gun legislation, right? Here's the White House. We're coming after your, after your guns. But of course, the best line, who in God's name needs a weapon with 100 rounds in a chamber? Doesn't even make sense. I, you know, I don't think anybody should be making or passing or introducing any law when they have never even taken a basic pistol course. For real, for real. So in our Pennsylvania Constitution, we have these uh, three things here that sort of help to protect the gun owners here. Our right to bear arms, instead of shall not be infringed, it shall not be questioned. Preemption which basically says every little town and municipality cannot make their own laws. So this happened in Pittsburgh. Remind me of the year, Josh, shout it out, where Bill Peduto said, we don't care. We're going to do it anyway. He full well knowingly signed gun control legislation, and everyone said, you can't do it. It's illegal. And the moment he signed the O in Peduto, four lawsuits were filed. And, of course, we won that but he cost the taxpayers a ton of money. I think that somebody here, do I have any representative here in Pennsylvania? You should propose a bill that says if anybody knowingly passes a bill that is unconstitutional or illegal, they have to personally pay all of the expenses and, and put back the money into the budget. You should be held personally, financially accountable for doing stuff that you knowingly or unknowingly. If you are a representative, you should read the Constitution and enforce that, right? Cannot maintain or create a gun registry. Here's another one. I see people on the floor all the time. Got to register it, register it. No, it's illegal. Here we go again. Can't do it. Four minutes. So I'm going to be on a list right now. <laughs> I think I'm already on a list anyway, most likely. Gun violence. This is the greatest PR term ever made up going forward in guns. Can someone please explain to me why violence by gun is different from violence by knife, by hammer, by sledgehammer, by screwdriver? But is violence any different? Violence is violence regardless. So this is a PR term that was made up to really push the fear of people into guns are bad, guns are bad. It just sits there. I filmed a VH1 episode, don't ask about it, but whatever. I was teaching and, uh, you know, there's like, oh, I'm like, did it do anything? It didn't do anything until you touch it, right? 
So gun control. These fellas here fund pretty much most of it. All righty. Uh, <clears throat> the one on the left <laughs> funds every town for gun safety, every town, um, which also has the Moms Demand Action. And they have a huge budget, like $36 million a year. You know, we work on 250000 for $36 million a year. They ship women in their red shirts to, to Alaska. My friend who's in Alaska, she's like, they flew in women up here. So he is funding most of this on the side of gun control. Our other person on the other side, because our phones are always listening, I'm not going to say that. Um, he works it, he's in it for the long game, the long game here. And I've heard other speakers um, at the conference mention about certain appointed DAs, certain appointed other positions. Here you are, <clears throat> number two's appointed person. Well, when we look at this, and trust me, I spent way too much time looking at this, I've heard people say, you know, violent crime is down. If you look at the FBI website from years past, the statistics will tell you that violent crime is down. Now, it doesn't also happen to mention to you that about between 17 and 19 percent of uh, precincts or municipalities aren't reporting their data, but bad guys aren't getting prosecuted for their crimes. So when a bad guy does something bad and he shows up in front of the DA in Philadelphia and he says, go ahead, you're done, free to go, it's not getting listed. So when you're free to go or you're getting a nonviolent felony instead of a firearms felony conviction that you should have had and no consequences for your action, guess what? The, the violent crime goes down but the bad guys go back out and they cause more crime, usually with illegal guns, which continues to stir the narrative and get people excited that, oh my God, guns are bad. Look at what all these bad people are doing. Here we go. Emotions versus fact. That's why I have big old pink pants on because conservative people don't scream. We don't scream, we don't get angry. Like Dinesh said yesterday, these people get on and they start trolling him. We don't do that. The other side screams and we don't. And here, you can appeal to the prejudices of other people, basically, by what I just said. They're not going to listen to fact, they listen to emotion. And actually, I've seen the MDA um, PR plan, and it always says, don't ever fight with the facts. You can't, you will lose every time if you argue with them over facts. Always use emotion. So if you saw this one that just came out, yeah, I'm going to be over time. Uh, the illegal immigrant in Chicago who was just afforded. Uh, his Second Amendment rights. So he was up on a gun charge. He's illegal with an illegal gun in Chicago um, with a shooting, and an Obama-appointed federal judge let him go and said he had the right under the Second Amendment to have that gun. Illegal immigrant with an illegal gun, he had a right under the Second Amendment, and that's where the right of the people is different from the right of the citizens. This should play out, which the thing that makes me angry is an absolute, absolute, absolutist on the 2A, everyone has the right to defend themselves, <clears throat> but people in Illinois have to jump through hoops, get their FOID card training, you name it, pay out the wazoo for permits and don't even get them sometimes, and here she just granted illegal rights under the, under the Second Amendment. So when guns are the answer, people say guns are never the answer, well yeah they could be. When you need to be your own first responder, because if the average 911 call is nine minutes, what are you going to do for the other eight minutes and 59 seconds? It's you. Don't let them win. And surely you've heard the Oregon 911 call where they had no police. The woman says, this guy's coming in. He put me in the hospital last month. She's like, we don't have anybody to send you. Can you ask him to go away? <laughs> She's like, no. He's like pinned the door down. His car's here. She's like, well, do you have a friend you can call? And then you hear crash, and the windows are breaking, and she ended up in the hospital again. So be your own first responder. The only right that's going to protect all others, and the only way to prevent the one party. When I say necessary to the security of a free state, that's what I mean. And when they say the Second Amendment wasn't made about hunting, oh no, it wasn't. Necessary to the security of a free state. 
So how do you get involved? So our tenets are to educate, preserve, and advocate for the Second Amendment. The thing that is really kind of yucky here, he said push something for a, there it is, 38% of gun owners vote. You know, it's great to hear everybody up here, register everybody to vote, get them to change their registration to Republican. That's great, but if they're not going to vote, what is the point? Maybe the, ma maybe the mail ins will help. Maybe the mail ins will bit for you saw how many bazillions of guns are owned by bazillions of people and only 38% nationwide vote. That is really, really sad. So elect those who are going to preserve your gun rights. And I will tell you that there are several um, representatives who we normally hold in high esteem on our Republican base who just voted for that $1.2 trillion spending bill in DC, which had no fewer than three major pieces of gun control legislation in it. Awful, absolutely awful. But they give you something like this. So tell your stories and run for office. And I'm over time. <laughs> I would like to remind everyone that the straw poll closes at 9. So please, if you haven't participated, would love for you to do so. Those are very illuminating, and we love seeing the results of those. So please, make sure you do that before 9 o'clock. Now, I want to introduce to you a young lady that I have worked with before. She is amazing. Right out of college, she jumped into a major campaign. She'll tell you more about it, I'm sure. She is with the Americans for Prosperity, Pennsylvania, and has always had an interest in politics and government. After graduating from the University of Pittsburgh, she immediately jumped headfirst into political campaigns. Politic Our climate here in Pennsylvania, as you know, in 2016 provided her an in-depth, hands-on experience in high-profile races, and she thrived in the fast-paced nature of the campaign lifestyle. I watched her do this. And don't you love seeing young people involved? Do you not love that? It's, not, it's, our, it's their future, but we love it. Passing that baton on to them. Emily joined the Americans for Prosperity Pennsylvania team in 2018 in the greater Pittsburgh region. Five years later, she now serves as deputy state director where she works to build policy coalitions in Harrisburg and fights for policy that allows PA to realize economic prosperity. Now, she, I hate to, I mean, I've got to tell you, she is a Steelers fan and I'm okay with that. I hope you are too. All right, even though she's from Philadelphia. And she'll be leading this panel on data-driven approach to mobilizing millions. Please welcome the lovely and very energetic Emily Green. Hello, everyone. We have got our esteemed panelists, if you want to join me. And I have to clear the record real quick. I grew up in Pittsburgh. I now live on the other side of the state. However, I will forever remain a Steelers fan, so. <laughs> well, good morning, Pennsylvania Leadership Conference. Has everyone had their coffee yet? Are you ready for a great panel? I see some uh, thumbs up in the back, so I think we're ready to roll. So my name is Emily Green. I serve as Deputy State Director with Americans for Prosperity Pennsylvania. I have been with the organization for six years now. And just by a show of hands, who has heard of Americans for Prosperity? Amazing, we love that, excellent. So Americans for Prosperity, we exist to remove governmental barriers to opportunity so every individual in this room can live out their version of the American dream, whatever that looks like to them. Now unfortunately, there have been a lot of threats to our American dream. We see that in both Harrisburg and Washington. There is no shortage of threats. Between the Biden administration and the Shapiro administration's attacks on, uh, attack on energy jobs, mm -hmm. between the threats of the open border, we have our work cut out for us as we march toward November. But I am so motivated by the group of people in this room. I know that if there's anyone in the Commonwealth that can save this country and save this Commonwealth, it's the people in this room. So we're gonna talk about how to do that. But first, I just wanna share if you've uh, seen our booth out in the lobby, you may have picked up a, a little keychain uh, toolkit. Our theme this year is, um, it is building your grassroots toolkit because the pathway to save our nation runs through Pennsylvania. That's, I'm sure, not lost on anyone here. Now, unfortunately, that path through Pennsylvania is about $120 in tolls on I-76. <laughs> but 
<laughs> That's okay. We can save the nation. We want to make sure that you have everything that you need to do to save the state. Because when we're looking back on this moment in history, I want to make sure that we said we could do, we did everything in our power to push the pendulum. The pendulum will swing, but we need to push it so that we have a freer and more prosperous Pennsylvania and America. So help us reignite the American dream. And to do that, I could preach for days, but I want to make sure that we introduce our esteemed guests this, uh, this morning. First, we have Eric Aldrich, Vice President of Analytics at I360. For the past 12 years, he has helped I360's clients leverage data to enhance their grassroots activity through advanced targeting on the front end and data-driven optimizations throughout. He is passionate about helping people use data to make smarter decisions and measure assumptions. He lives in Arlington, Virginia, and I love this. He has never had a bad day in his life. Not so, Brad, or, or, Eric, thank you so much for being here this morning. So you just concluded a two-week poll in the field in Pennsylvania. Knowing the results of this poll, what do likely Pennsylvania voters actually care about? Tell us everything. Yeah, so um, we had a, a poll come out of the field uh, just a couple weeks ago, and the, the results on the top issue were kind of unsurprising because it kind of mirrors what we've seen as we've done polling across the nation. And that's, in spite of what you might hear on the news, the two issues that people actually care about are immigration and the border and the economy and inflation. Uh, and so in spite of all efforts from the left to try and pivot, um, either by talking about how great the Biden economy is or by talking about other potential wedge issues, it's not doesn't seem to be resonating. The people that you guys are talking to, they still care about those main issues. And it's remarkable that in a state like Pennsylvania, so far north, immigration and the border is such a big issue. It was ranked number one on our poll by our, by our likely voters, and I think that's a, a huge um, opportunity for us to, to, to continue to hammer Biden and, and the Democrats on that issue. Exactly. So we talk a lot about reaching swing voters. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Because no person in this room joining us at 8.45 on a Saturday morning to talk about politics is a swing voter. Mm -hmm. So can you walk us through what that voter model looks like and why it's important that everyone in this room reaches out to five swing voters in their orbit about November? Yeah, uh, you know, Pennsylvania is going to be tough. Maybe, maybe do like seven to ten, if you guys can. Uh, you can reach for a stretch goal there. Um, sw swing voters are just people in the middle, and that could be on any issues. Um, you know, the, I mentioned the top two issues that, that people seem to care about. Those aren't the only issues that matter in this campaign. Um, and so thinking about who your swing voter is kind of depends at least a little bit on what issue you're talking about. Um, but generally speaking, swing voters are people who are uncommitted. And there's a lot of ways that you can go at those. Some of them are more compliant than others. I know in, in a state like Pennsylvania, where there is partisan registration, um, there's sort of this shortcut that if you ignore that registered Republicans and registered Democrats, your X minus one gets your swing voter. And that can be a really fast way to do things, but it's not necessarily a complete way to do things. Especially, and Brian and I were having a conversation about this a couple weeks ago, there's a, a big increase in the number of people who are registering unaffiliated. Uh, and there's a tendency to assume that all of those unaffiliated voters are naturally going to be swing voters. <laughs> And this is not new. Um, you know, I've been, as, as Emily said, I've been with I360 for almost 13 years. We see this a lot. And what sometimes is driving that is not necessarily a true swing position, but disaffection with the partisan system. And, and so if you look at the, that poll that, that I mentioned, um, especially for swing voters, for who I360 considers swing voters, a concern about the, sh the, the, the shape of democracy showed up as a key issue for people. And so what we're finding is a lot of these swing voters might just be done with the party, but they still bring their partisan voting behavior and their partisan voting attitudes to the table. And so while they check unaffiliated in the box, that's really more of a statement on where they stand against the official party system than it is their willingness to be persuadable on any of the key issues or on any of the key candidates that might be of interest in people in this room. Um, and so at I360, we don't really just rely on that, right? We have 700 data points on everybody in the country. Um, our attitude is let's go talk to voters and get an understanding of who actually are the people who are persuadable or are <coughs> swing voters based on survey research information, and let's model to that. And certainly partisan ID, um, you know, partisan registration is a, is a large component 
of how we define those swing voters, but it's not everything because it just doesn't get to um, how people actually vote. And if you look at our data, that unaffiliated universe, more than 40% of them we would consider partisans based on our modeling and based on current information. Because that's the other thing you have to remember. If you're just leveraging partisan ID or partisan registration, that's a dated thing, right? I registered to vote in Virginia 14 years ago. I was a very different person 14 years ago. And actually, I looked a lot more like the picture that was in the program. <laughs> Apologize for catfishing the room. Um, <laughs> but I was, I was a very different people. And so you, you, you also get a lot of these voters that registered when they turned 18 as a, as a part of motor voter. They, maybe they registered as a Democrat because they were idealistic and foolish. That doesn't necessarily mean they still hold those beliefs. And so relying on something more in-depth and more complete than, than simple registration um, can get you a more robust point of view. So it's early, and I can see everyone's still drinking their coffee. We've talked about voter models, so maybe we should do a sample uh, model here. Why don't we start with a few questions? So you get a sense of what we're asking people at the door. So this is how we build that voter model. So I want everyone to raise their hand. You uh, just you know, share what you believe. Do you believe that the country's best days are behind us, or do you believe that people can still achieve the American dream? So how many people feel that the country's best days are behind us? Okay. How many people think that we can still achieve the American dream? This is a much more optimistic group than what we see across all 67 counties. About two-thirds of voters in Pennsylvania believe that we, the country's best days are behind us. Mm -hmm. So that's the attitude of voters that, that we're attempting to reach. Mm -hmm. And those data points help us best understand how we approach these voters, mm -hmm. how we talk with them in a, in a pragmatic way that moves them more toward our side of uh, freedom and liberty. So you broke down the issues for us, Eric. What's interesting, you shared some of the results of the polls with me. Only 2% of voters care most about access to abortion. We know that the left continues to make this their, their Alamo in Pennsylvania. I mean, we saw this time and time and again uh, in November of 2022 during the midterms. Where is that disconnect, do you believe? Yeah, uh, you know, the issue, the issue of abortion will always be of import to people. Um, what we're seeing is this just not the key issue any longer in Pennsylvania. And I don't like I fully understand why the left is doing that because it's been an effective strategy for them for, I don't know, ever. It's the same reason why they never codified Roe because it is a cudgel that they can use to beat people over the head. Now, if you look at polls roughly comparably timed in 2022, since you mentioned it, 20% of people called that the key issue. Our poll shows 2%. Um, why, why, that, why that disparity? A couple reasons. One, the election happened like 11 and a half seconds after Dobbs was released, so it was top of mind. There's other issues that are more pressing and more in the news right now. Uh, and two, the left's whole shtick on abortion access is, is doomsday scenarios. And so they were effective in doing that because there was a great sense of the unknown about what actually would happen with abortion access. And what we've seen across the states is more what Republicans predicted, which is states are coming up with state-based approaches. And so they're going to continue to talk about it because it can be a winning issue. And they're going to try and drive that wedge as deep into the electorate as possible. They might be successful, right? You, the the, the um, abortion pill case should be coming out at the end of the summer. That could bring this issue back to the forefront. But right now, it's just, it's important, but it's not what's driving people's behaviors and choices. Well, thank you so much for being here. I know Eric's going to be sticking around at our booth, so if you have any questions about some of the polls that were just done here in Pennsylvania, I'm sure he'd be willing to do a quick deep dive. Next, I'd like to introduce my colleague Brian Teeley, Deputy State Director of Americans for Prosperity Florida. He is a Florida native and a graduate of Florida State University. Prior to joining AFP, Brian worked in management for various companies in Tallahassee, as well as being a freelance writer and a photographer. He joined Stand Together Community in 2015 as a field director and built a strong community of activists across the panhandle. 
Since then, he has held various roles within the community and became deputy state director last year. While not working, he spends time with his rather large family in Tallahassee, and you will find him traveling to various locations across the globe in his mission to visit every country. So we've got a traveler here. He's with us here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. It was a little cold for him this morning when he uh, left the hotel. So Brian, welcome to Pennsylvania. The team down in Florida has been having some really great success in recent years. How much of that do you attribute to what we just heard Eric walk through? Yeah. Thanks so much, Emily, for having me out. And it is freezing here. I don't know if you all knew this. Uh, I'm sure you guys are enjoying the spring day, but for me, this is winter. Uh, it was uh, 78 degrees when I left Florida, and, you know, it's less than that now, and that was cold for us. So um, what Eric talked about has really been critical to our success down in Florida. Um, we really have devoted ourselves to the ID data, to really improving all those touch points that Eric talked about because we know it makes the difference in our elections. Um, so a couple of years ago, we got together with our state director uh, at the time, Chris Hudson, and really talked about how our I360 data looks and the gaps in the data. As Eric talked about, there's a lot of you know, not affiliated people now in our state and we didn't have great data on them. So we, we made a very direct effort uh, and over the past roughly 10 years, we've done over eight million contact attempts in our state, all across the state, to really improve that data. And then we use that data to improve our resource utilization. So the number one thing for probably every organization that you guys are a part of, but certainly for us, is resource utilization. And that doesn't just mean money, although that is an important one. Um, it also really, for us, means our volunteers. Uh, if you haven't come out and volunteered for AFP before, I hope you will. But what makes us different than some of the other groups and even the party is we utilize your time as effective as possible. We want to get to the right voters to talk about the right messaging. So it's not just going with a generic message. It's going to somebody who cares about health care and talking to them about health care. It's going to somebody who talk, wants deregulation and talking about deregulation. And that just improves our effectiveness. But also from the monetary, mail is still a big thing for AFP as it is for most organizations. Sending a mailer to somebody who doesn't want to receive it is a wasted mailer. That's money out of our pocket and really just reduces our effectiveness. So we've really focused on that and through the utilization of I360, as Eric said, uh, I'm, Maybe unfortunately for him, uh, I spent a lot of time with his team, um, but we've, we've put it to good use and down in Florida over the last couple of years, we've seen over 95% success rate on our elections. Uh, that includes many congressional races, including highly contested one. Of course, uh, we endorsed the, our governor, Ron DeSantis, uh, and helped him to his overwhelming victory a couple of years ago. Uh, and we're really just across the board, not only at the federal level, but even at the state level, we're seeing huge swings as far as our effectiveness. In fact, uh, on the last cycle, for the first time since Reconstruction, we got a Republican elected in the state capital county, which has been democratically run for a hundred and something years. <laughs> it is still a very blue county, a very blue district, but we were able to go talk to the voters in that district who may be registered as Democrat, but that's not their belief system, right? They want that lower tax burden. They want lower burdens on their businesses. So we went and talked to them and said, hey, you've had you know, Democratic senators in your district for 100 years. How has that gone for you? How have you appreciated that vote? And overwhelmingly, we saw you know, people say, oh, yeah, no, for sure, that's not been my voice. They, they haven't represented me. So now we have somebody that represents them, uh, even if it doesn't represent their party. Excellent. That's really good. And so we see Florida as the bastion of freedom. I mean, my goodness, we're leaving, losing Pennsylvanians every day to Florida in droves. So would you say in, you know, when we think about Florida, we see it as red. Would you say Florida is now a red state? Yeah. Well, first off, thanks for sending all of your uh, conservatives down to us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, you know, be, before COVID, we were already seeing, uh, you know, a bit of an influx. Um, people come into our, to our climate, right? If you want to start a small business, Florida's the place to be. Then, of course, COVID hit. And man, did that start a movement to come to Florida, right? We were 
open for business, uh, all but a very short period. We were, we were fighting to keep our businesses running, to keep people employed, and that just continued to drive people here. And so we were just talking earlier today, uh, I think the most recent statistic, it was like something like 17 people a minute were moving to Florida. Um, it, it is crazy. So in answer to your question, when I started with our organization, we were very purple uh, and all of our cities were blue. Um, now, I would say the simple answer is yes. We have finally seen the Republicans overtake the Democrats as far as party registration, but I think the answer is a lot more complicated than that, and as I just spoke about, it's really about the conservative values that are taking over our state. So even if you're registered Democrat, we're now seeing conservative Democrats that are moving to the state of Florida because that's the policies that they support. That's the environment they want to be in. Um, so we're, we're seeing a huge shift there. Uh, of course, we still do have, you know, some some hot spots around in our in our major metros, uh, but the shift is really on. Um, but I think what's even more interesting, and Eric touched on this a good bit for you guys, is the non-affiliated registrations in our state. Uh, we are at 28% now of our state that are not one of the two major parties, and most are now NPA, uh, and that's growing every year. And because I'm a data guy, uh, like Eric, I looked at PAs, you guys are 15% and growing, and since you all passed your most recent voter registration bill, you guys are actually have now more NPAs registering than either of the two parties. So when we talk about the importance of that data and talking about what voters actually care about, it means all the difference because as our organization or any organization you guys represent, that person that registered, you have no idea where they land, right? You, should you target them? Should you leave them alone? You don't know. Are they even going to vote? Uh, you know, it's, I think it's based on driver's licenses. Looking for a head to nod on this legislation. Uh, but that, you know, some people are just registering because they have to now, but they're never going to vote. So sending them mail, sending one of our volunteers for you guys in the snow, for us in the 100 degree weather to that door, for somebody who never has voted before and never plans to vote is just a waste of resources. So we're really focused on, on trying to identify not just what party you're associated with or what color our state is, but really where our values sit as a state. Excellent, and I think really that good. tees up, up, us up perfectly to introduce our last but not least, our final panelist, my colleague Roslyn Williams, Grassroots Engagement Director with Americans for Prosperity Pennsylvania. Roslyn moved back to Philadelphia in 2021 and changed her political position from Democrat to Republican after assessing her moral and political <laughs> views. You got some claps. <laughs> I love it. She says, freedom is important to me, and once I recognized that it was being threatened, I woke up. Roslyn immediately got involved with the Philly GOP, serving as a war, lead, war leader and even running for office. Mm -hmm. As a result of these new relationships, Roslyn learned about Americans for Prosperity and applied for her current role, where she has hit the ground running <laughs> in the belly of the beast, Philadelphia County. So, yes, Roslyn, <laughs> cheers to you. You're on the front lines right now in the most philosophically difficult corner of our Commonwealth. What are you hearing and seeing on the ground? Okay, well first I want to thank Americans for Prosperity for even having me to be a guest panelist, uh, to even be able to share my experiences with grassroots, because grassroots is something that I'm very passionate about, and because I'm passionate, we're lighting them up and waking them up. Is that all right? <laughs> and so, you know, what you just asked me was, what are we hearing and seeing? What are we hearing? One of the most important things I tell people all the time is that in this particular dispensation of time, it's not about what we have that are different, but it's that most people on the doors, we have more things in common than we do that's apart. And that is simply some, one of the things that my colleague here said is that we all want good values, right? Americans for Prosperity always talks about the American dream. I shared with Emily, I said, I never even considered, did I have an, a chance at the American dream? A lot of the people that I talk to at the doors in my particular city in Philadelphia don't even know if they have a possibility at the American dream. Because what does the American dream really look like to a person like me that had come from a democratic background where they all they promote is free food and fake promises? Is that okay? If I may be blunt and may be able to speak freely. However, we have learned that we have more people that consider, believe in working hard, believe in doing the right things, believe in family. And once we've had the opportunity to wake up 
we're waking other people up to understand that this is true. And so a lot of the people that we're talking to at the doors, we meet some people that don't even want to vote anymore. Now, some of these people are not swing voters, but those were regular voters, and they were your voters that you have lost because of some of the games that's being played out here in the field. In the field, it is time for us to all unite, come together based off what our values are, as my colleague said here, and put aside our differences. And let's stop separating us and calling us the black vote, the white vote. Let's call us voters of all different demographics. Is that okay? If I may say. We need more unity. If we're going to make a difference this year in this election, we need, we need more unity. We need to open up the door and to invite all people in, not just some people, not just some groups. I heard somebody say in the last um, thing, they said that um, this is not the old Republican Party that your fathers had. This is a party of people, not about red or blue, but about the who's who, who you are, why you running, what you planning on doing, how you going to do it, and where's your outline so we the people can hold you accountable because you have a whole new swing voters that have come in now today and we're ready to fight for the American dream alongside you. Not underneath you, but along with you. Because we understand how important it is to save this country because God's hand is still on this country. That's I hope that helps. Excellent. Yes, ma'am. And Roslyn, you and I sat in a diner not too long ago, mm -hmm. um, about four miles from where President Joe Biden was going to drop in, parachute in, talk about his failed uh, economic policy. Mm -hmm. Check out Bidenomics.com if you'd like to learn more. <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> we bought the URL. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you and I sat in that diner, mm -hmm. and we shared how Biden's policies are failing the residents of Philadelphia. Yes, and we talked with a woman, I'll never forget, who told us, I'm homeless. I had a fixed income, it was my son, he passed away from a drug overdose, mm -hmm. I don't know where my next meal is gonna come from. And when we talked with her about Biden's failed policies, you could see that something was waking up, you could see it in her eyes. She felt a little sense of, I, I don't know, I, I guess excitement mm -hmm. that there's another way. Are you seeing that frequently when you're talking with voters across the city? Now, you know, that's, that's something good that uh, Emily just asked me because one of the things that I always say to individuals as I'm engaging them at the door is that you do understand that there is another option on the table. It's not just the option that you have been given that you must live in poverty, that you must be in a place that you're living check to check, you understand that you must be in a position where you don't know where your next meal is coming from. Because prior to me getting this job, that was my story. Because when I lost my job as a Democrat for not getting that vaccination, you understand, it set me back financially tremendously. And my obligation was not to go get welfare, not to get unemployment, but to work my way back to a position until God could bless me once again, right? Mm -hmm. Now, so, so with that said, the spark in that lady's eyes was to know that there are other people out here that understands her plight. Now, the difference is now, let's, let's help that lady to understand how she too can get involved to help herself, to lift herself up. Not me going to grab her by her hand and try to find some free program for her. But let me talk to her about you too, how you too, ma'am, can help yourself to get to that next level and maybe achieve an American dream. And so her story is no different than my story. It's no different than a lot of Philadelphian stories, right? But those stories are changing. Why? Because we have woken up, we are rising up, and we understand that we too have a right to what everybody else has and that is the American dream that God wants all people to have. And so I'm just saying today, if we all can unite, I can see us changing uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, just like my buddies talked about here, what he did in Florida, because it's serious for us. It's a lot of us out here that wanna see us have that change in November. And so I'm excited and we need you. We need you to send us individuals that are not afraid to go and make that ask and knock on that door. I will say this, Emily, I had a good conversation with a young lady at a door, uh, Miss Pat, up in uh, Allentown. We were out in Allentown knocking doors. And Miss Pat is about 80, 82 years old. And when I showed up at Miss Pat's door, she was actually in the garage and me and her were talking and she, was, she started crying because she said, she said, our country is getting ready to be a communist country. 
right? She started crying on me, and she said, I was just watching somebody, Matt Walsh, Matt Walsh or somebody uh, who read this, um, oh God, what's the thing called? Manifest. She said, I was just watching him today, and she said, we're, we're in trouble. Our country is in trouble. And I had to ignite something in Miss Pat. I had to say, Miss Pat, it's not over yet, because you got individuals like me that's out here on the doors to engage people like you. I said, and we're out here selling and telling you that God is not going to let this country go down if only his people, people like us, people that believe in good values, if we would speak up, stop hiding in the house, wake up everybody else in our own house, we can see a good revolution. And I just believe it for Miss Pat. And by the time I left her, by the time I left Miss Pat Ashley, Miss Pat looked at me and said, young lady, I'm so glad that you came to my house. She said, you have inspired me. And I called my colleague, I said, we must adopt Miss Pat because we need more Miss Pats. We also need more younger ones. We need to build that, that gap and let's bring ourselves all together as one party, one unity, and let's get this job done that we must see done in 2024. I hope that's all right, Emily. I don't know what else more can be said after that. Thank you, Roslyn. We're Americans for Prosperity. We want to, oh, I. Are there statements from people that are skewing the polls? Because they're saying that Trump is not going to win. You know what? I, why don't, we're going to be right outside. If you'd like to ask any questions, we will, we will be there. So please join us at our booth. Help build your grassroots toolkit. Because, again, we don't want to look back on history in this moment and say we didn't do everything in our power, in our toolkit, to push this pendulum That's towards right. one of freedom and prosperity. Amen. We've got the data. We've got encouragement from our good friends in Florida. And we've got Roslyn preaching the good word in the belly of the beast. <laughs> Philly is not insurmountable. No, so not. with that, we're Americans for Prosperity. Thank you, guys. Check us out. Build your grassroots toolkit. Thank you. <laughs>
So uh, we'd like to begin. We also don't have a, a timer, so we're uh, going to try to get to as many questions as possible. So we'd like to start out by uh, asking each candidate to introduce themselves uh, and talk about uh, and talk about why they're running to be Pennsylvania's next Attorney General. And we will start uh, with Mr. Sunday. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So it's an honor to be here with you. My name is Dave Sunday. I'm the District Attorney in York County, and I'm running for Attorney General. So I grew up. <laughs> um, I. I grew up here in central Pennsylvania, and at the age of 18, I went and uh, joined the Navy right out of high school. I was enlisted, so I swabbed decks and I chipped paint. I was deployed all throughout the world. I was in the Persian Gulf for Desert Strike, and I also served in uh, Central and South America doing counter-drug operations. I came home from my deployment for after four years of active duty, and I started working at UPS. And so my path to be on this stage is a little different than a lot of my uh, you know, friends and colleagues but I'm very proud of it. So I started working at UPS. I did my undergraduate work during the day, and I worked at UPS at night. And then I worked at UPS during the day, and I went to law school at night. And so those 12 years of being an enlisted guy, plus those eight years of uh, working at UPS through college and law school were really just a tremendous blessing in my life. It laid the foundation for who I became um, as a leader, for the foundation who I became as an elected district attorney, and at the end of law school, I met my wife, and uh, my, my wife and I have a son now. He's in uh, third grade. He's nine. Today was supposed to be his first soccer game, but he was up with a fever all night, so that's not happening. Um, but um, after law school, I ended up uh, clerking for a judge in York County, and then I went right into the DA's office. Next year will be my 17th year in York County. Um, I've served as a prosecutor in York County for 16 of those years. I've been a federal prosecutor as I was a special assistant United States attorney where we, look, where we uh, prosecuted large gang cases from the city of York. Many of you know York is directly north of Baltimore and that puts uh, certain challenges upon us. Um, to that point, I also was chief of litigation, ran our major crimes unit, longtime jury trial prosecutor, and I went on to become the elected district attorney. So I served as the elected DA and uh, I served in that, that capacity all through COVID and everything that came with that, I was reelected as DA. And I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm running for attorney general because if our communities are not safe, then nothing else matters. It is the absolute most important part of what we do. And if we do not have safe families and a safe environment for our children, then no matter what else we do as a society, it absolutely won't matter. I have fought this battle for my career in a courtroom i fought fentanyl, I have fought gangs, and I have done everything I can to bring my philosophy of accountability and redemption to the district attorney's office. As a result of that, crime has decreased by 30% since I took office, and it's just wonderful to be here. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <clears throat> State Representative uh, Williams, if you want to tell the crowd a little bit about yourself. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me here today. Um, as was just said, I am state representative from the Delaware County, Chester County area. My district is about geographically split between the two. Um, unlike Dave, I'm not originally from here. I'm from Alaska, and that comes to play in my story in, in just a moment. I went from Alaska to Duke University on a Navy ROTC scholarship uh, and then was commissioned in the Marine Corps. While I was at the basic school, I got selected for flight training, uh, went to Pensacola and ended up in the F-18, where I served a combat tour in Desert Storm, flew 56 combat missions. Uh, when I came back to Pensacola as a flight instructor, I was selected for the Marine Corps Law Education Program, went to the University of Florida, where uh, I was trained to become um, not only a lawyer, but then later a judge advocate. I was the chief prosecutor of Camp Pendleton in California, the biggest base in the Marine Corps. I left active duty in 2000 and went to Columbia Law School to get a master's in legal philosophy and criminal law. I smile because um, that's a passion of mine that I don't think I'll ever be able to monetize. Um, legal philosophy is just something you do and you are. It was when I was in Columbia that I got a, a judicial clerkship um, with the 11th Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals in Atlanta, the chief judge. About halfway through that clerkship, Chief Judge Edmondson comes into my office and he says something that changed my life. He said, you've been a nomad your whole life, being a Marine Corps officer. It's time for you to settle down, 
get married, have some children, and run for office. And I was like, okay. Um, he's like, well, I say that because you have three job offers from Washington, D.C. Nobody's from there. They go there from somewhere else. So sure enough, I changed my path, went from Washington to Denver, Colorado, where I was in the U.S. Attorney's Office as a federal prosecutor doing gun violence, um, uh, violent gang crime, and illegal immigration, and fell in love with a Philadelphia girl. And as Paul Harvey used to say, now you know the rest of the story why I'm a Pennsylvanian. <laughs> Um, I then took orders back to active duty in the Marine Corps to be deputy legal counsel to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, where I did ethics and detainee litigation in federal court, um, then ended up in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Philadelphia, ran for Congress in 2008, which was another life change, because that 2008 election is where I pitched over into Pennsylvania's energy sector, talking about the fact that I understand exploration of our natural resources being from Alaska, being the lead surrogate in Pennsylvania for McCain Palin, running in 2008. And then I spent the next 10 years doing energy law before I ran for the Pennsylvania House in 2020, in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of President Trump's run that year. And I ran in Delaware County, where Republicans were losing, and I won by 600 votes. I ran again in 2022 for re-election in an area where fewer Republicans were winning, and I won again by 1,500 votes. And that's part of why I answered the question about running for attorney general in this way. I'm tired of losing. I'm sick and tired of losing as a Republican party. I'm also sick and tired of living, living next door to a place like Philadelphia where crime is out of control. And where crime is out of control in Philadelphia for one reason, and it's not just Philadelphia, it's all of the major cities of the Commonwealth. One reason, lack of prosecution. And what I'm bringing to the table is a bona fide, bad to the bone, law and order message about prosecuting in these large cities, and that's why I'm running for Attorney General. Gentlemen, let's talk about the office, the, the, the office of, the, of the Attorney General. Uh, in Pennsylvania, we've seen different attorneys general uh, approach the job differently, some as strict constructionists enforcing the law, uh, some clearly activists pursuing an agenda. Uh, how would you approach the role of attorney general? Let's stay with you, uh, Mr. Williams. Yeah, so that's a great question. It's important to understand that the office of the attorney general is not just about prosecuting crime. That's one quarter of the office. There are four offices in the attorney general's office criminal, civil, public protection, and public engagement. So we've talked a little bit at the outset about the necessity to have an aggressive prosecutor in the attorney general's job. But equally important is somebody who can go into that job on day one and in the civil division defend the Constitution of Pennsylvania against attacks from the other side. And what do I mean by that? The governor has already entered into an executive order binding Pennsylvania into the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, REGI. That's unconstitutional. Now, who in our government is going to take this government to, I'm sorry, this governor to task in the Commonwealth Court and then the Pennsylvania Supreme Court? It's the Attorney General through the civil division of that office. That's number one. Number two, the Office of Public Protection. I have litigated with and against the Office of Consumer Advocate. I've been involved with the Office of Consumer Protection relative to fraud and protecting consumers. I sit right now on the Consumer Protection Committee in the House of Representatives and I'm the, the subcommittee chair of the Utility Subcommittee. I understand consumer protection. There, to answer your question very directly, the Attorney General's office has a role in crime, they have a role in protecting the Constitution, and they have a role immediately in tilting with this governor against his unconstitutional behavior. Mr. Sunday, your thoughts on, on the role of Attorney General? Sure, absolutely. Clearly, the Attorney General is the Chief Law Enforcement Officer for the Commonwealth. And again, I go back to the principle that if we are not safe, nothing else matters. Turning to the role of the Attorney General with regard to consumer advocacy. In Pennsylvania, we have the third highest percentage of senior citizens that live in our state. And I can tell you right now that those senior citizens deserve our protection. They deserve our advocacy because I'm going to tell you what, God willing, we all get to be that age someday. We're not going to want someone to take what we have. And so as a prosecutor, I experienced a case very personally where there was a, an older gentleman. He had dementia. 
and someone came to his house to, um, a contractor came to his house to uh, do something. And the gentleman wrote him a check. And the contractor came back the next day. And the gentleman wrote him a second check. And the gentleman and the contractor came back a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth day. And this gentleman kept writing him checks for the exact same work that was done. And because he had dementia, this guy thought he was going to get away with it. And so we identified it. I took it to a jury trial, and he was prosecuted and convicted at a jury trial, and he was sent to prison. It is absolutely <laughs> critical with the resources that the Attorney General's office has that we focus it on the things that make our communities safer and better. And I think that when you view the Attorney General's office, obviously we can talk about the crime side till the end of days. And to me, that is the most important reason why I'm running for Attorney General for Public Safety. But at the same time, as a consumer advocate, we must advocate for the people that are the weakest amongst us, the people that have no one to protect them, the people that need someone to stand up for them. And I think right off the bat of the senior citizens in Pennsylvania that need a prosecutor's mentality to go in there and keep them safe. And in addition to that, I think of the role with regard to children, to children. As the elected district attorney, I have increased in my office. Actually, we created from scratch an entire computer forensic team that does nothing but fight to identify people that are trafficking child pornography. And through that, we've been able to identify not just the people that are doing that and prosecute them to, to help children, but we have also collaborated with the community to identify victims of human trafficking. And human trafficking is one of the most just repulsive, disgusting crimes that's occurring in our community right now. And so you have the criminal side that we can go into and I'd love to talk yeah. about. And on the other side of it with advocacy, we must use our resources to advocate for the people that need our help and protection. So, so let's, let's talk a little more yeah. about um, cr uh, crime and, and the surge of criminal activity yes. our communities are experiencing has already come up, but, uh, but it's worth digging into deeper. Yeah. Uh, one of the key roles of the Attorney General is combating crime, but how do you do it? What are the reasons for the criminal activity? How can you as Attorney General from your statewide post best combat the surge in crime. We'll start with you, um, uh, Mr. Williams. Yeah, so I've actually been working on this in the context of the House of Representatives. Um, it is indisputable, indisputable, that the overwhelming amount of violent crime is committed by a prior convicted felon. And as a consequence of that, what I've been doing from the House of Representatives is targeting prior convicted felons found in possession of guns and trying to take those cases federally. And the reason for that is a federal prosecution of a prior convicted felon in possession of a gun carries with it a substantial federal sentence and there's no parole in the federal system. So as a consequence of that, I got a million and a half dollars in the state budget the first year I was in the House, and then three million dollars per year since then to increase the number of assistant district attorneys in Philadelphia and Delaware County in my region to take those cases federal. Get them out of the hands of Larry Krasner, the district attorney of Philadelphia, who's not prosecuting those crimes. Get him out of his hands and take them into federal court where we can get severe sentences and get those people off the street. That's number one, public safety, and number two, deterrence. You send a message to the streets of Philadelphia that we're coming and we're serious. That's number one. Number two, and from the attorney general's point of view, if the district attorney of Philadelphia is not going to prosecute crime, I will. I will be there with assistant uh, attorney generals and agents, and we will find those felons in possession of guns, and we'll take them into federal court with the coordination of the U.S. Attorney's Office. That's violent crime. But then there's a secondary part, too, which is we've got to, we've got to start doing something about addiction, because addiction is feeding the criminal element. It is feeding the need for criminality. I lost my brother in 2020 to an overdose. And I want to tell you this very brief story because it is another one of those moments where if you're paying attention, it will change your life. It changed mine. I was in 
The county jail visiting, the county jail where I live is in my legislative district. And I was visiting with men who were undergoing drug treatment. And after about an hour, I asked this question of the group. It's like, do you guys remember the first day you decided to start using drugs? Because I was genuinely curious if they remember that moment. And this guy who hadn't said a word to me the entire time said, man, you got this all wrong. I said, what do I have wrong? He said, it wasn't the, the day I decided to use drugs. It was the day that my mom's boyfriend raped me. And I was like, whoa. And suddenly, they weren't all telling me their stories, but they were all saying exactly the same thing. It's like, yeah, I'm dealing with something. And that's the day I started learning about trauma-informed therapy, trying to help somebody understand their why. And it turns out that in the criminal context, you can do the same thing with people that are willing to try to understand their why, especially young men. So we're about to open the Glen Mills School um, in a trial pilot basis in my district to try to get young men in there to understand their why for criminal behavior and see if they can't change the trajectory of their life through their own choices rather than imprisonment. And if they are willing to do that, then we can find some compassion. Let's, let's pivot to talking about some, uh, some economic and business issues. We don't always think about the Attorney General from an economic and, and business climate uh, perspective, but we have seen uh, Attorney Generals impact the economy. Unfortunately, we've seen it by uh, uh, AGs in the past can, can take more of a, a combative and punitive approach to employers. How do you view the Attorney General's role in the economy, in business, uh, climate issues, and interacting with employers? Uh, Mr. Sunday, we'll start with you. So to start with, if you want to be an activist Attorney General, then that's the path for you to become a Democrat governor. <laughs> and that's not something that I think anyone here wants to ever see with their Attorney General. My philosophy is being fair and just. And so from my years of working, not only through the Navy, but through working all those years at UPS, I discovered that one of the most powerful forces that exist is that of capitalism. And to the point where I have seen people that have come out of prison that have been on probation, parole, work release, you name it. And they have, I have worked side by side with them in some of the hardest jobs you could possibly do. And I've seen their lives change because what happens is when they recognize that they have the power within themselves to change their lives, that's one of the most powerful forces that you could ever imagine. And so when it comes to being an attorney general and to having the ability to impact the community through the business environment, we must, must, must take a hands-off approach. We must stand back and speak with all of the different individuals that are involved with the different issues that come up, to talk to them, to identify what their actual issues are, and to view the way that we approach these issues through the lens of collaboration for the betterment of our society, and not always through the lens of what can I do to get you. One of the worst things that I have seen over the last five to 10 years with regard to being a chief law enforcement officer is the fact that in other places around this country, people have stopped investigating crimes and they have started investigating people. And that can never, ever be the case. That can never happen. And as Attorney General, and speaking to you through the lens of someone who has been the twice elected chief law enforcement officer in a large county directly north of Baltimore, I can tell you that that philosophy is the philosophy that Pennsylvania needs and it is the philosophy that I will bring to the role of Attorney General. Mr. Mr. Williams, the AG's role in economic and, and business issues. Yeah, so the question is about the economy and business um, impact in the Attorney General's office, and of course that's in the civil division. Um, let me give you just a few examples, and I've touched on one already. You can absolutely open the door for economic opportunity in Pennsylvania if you did one thing today and that's to get out of the way of the energy sector. We've, we are sitting on a virtual energy gold mine right here in Pennsylvania, and one thing has locked it down, and that is progressive policies that say you're not allowed to pull that natural resource out of the ground, 
You're not allowed to get it down to the southeast of Pennsylvania where we would benefit from both refining, refining and transporting either overseas to other, or to other places in the United States. And that is because, of, as Dave correctly said, a progressive policy that started in the Attorney General's office with the current governor, going after energy companies in the southeast for building pipelines, filing criminal cases against energy companies. You've got the Biden administration unilaterally shutting down energy development in Pennsylvania by way of the EPA. The Attorney General absolutely has a role to play in that. This is not a hands-off moment. This is somebody stepping into that role in day one, understanding the issues, having litigated in those issues already, and taking the governor to task in the Commonwealth Court. Immediately, leveling the playing field for us making sure that our economy in Pennsylvania is unlocked. And it's not just there, right? It's the National Transportation Safety Board, which came into Pennsylvania and said that it wanted to take over certain investigations. We have, we have a stake in the outcome of those investigations, and they cannot lock down the Pennsylvania Utilities Commission from doing their investigation and telling us the right answers. I don't trust the Biden administration to tell me what happened. I don't trust the Biden administration to go out and file a lawsuit against wrongdoers. That's the Attorney General's job, not Joe Biden's. So yeah, there's a huge role to play for the Attorney General in our economy. Gentlemen, you're not only running to be the Republican nominee for Attorney General, you're also running to be a statewide leader in the Republican Party. Uh, some say party is fractured beyond repair. Others, and I'll paraphrase Mark Twain, say reports of the party's demise are greatly exaggerated. Uh, what say you, in about a minute, uh, how do you bring together the Republican Party to win statewide office? Uh, Mr. Sunday? Well, I'd like to start with the fact that the left clearly wants nothing more than for us to be divided. All you need to do is look on social media, go on, look at the news at night, look at your local papers. It is beyond evident that their sole purpose is to keep us divided. And ask yourself, why is it that they want that? Why do they want to keep us divided? You better believe it. It's because they want us to lose. The most important thing to them is that we lose. And the worst thing that they could ever imagine is that we come together as a team. And we work together as a team. Because I'm going to tell you right now, when you work together as a team, anything can be done. Anything can be done. And to that point, I have traveled throughout the entirety of the Commonwealth. I have been campaigning for Attorney General very, very hard. And I have spoken to people from all walks of life. And I'm going to tell you right now, what I've discovered is that Republicans and conservatives are ready to win. And there are so much more that keeps us together than could ever tear us apart. I'm going to tell you right now, when we stop listening to them on social media, when we stop listening to them on the news at night, and we start looking at each other, and we start working together as a team, the worst thing that will happen ever to the Democrats will be the best thing for us. And that's going to be that we are going to win this November. So in, in about a minute and a half, uniting the Republican Party, Representative Williams. We're sitting on a precipice as a party in Pennsylvania sitting on a precipice. I know we say this all the time about this is the most important election of our lifetime. We are sitting here right now at a moment where the Republican Party in Pennsylvania is about to become irrelevant if we don't start winning some elections. We're about to become one of those blue states that presidential elections write off. Colorado used to be deeply red, now it's deeply blue. And we are sitting right there, but for one thing, which is getting this party back on track getting this party back on track. And that's gonna require an additional thing. I've traveled the state too. I've traveled the state talking to all manner of Republicans. And what they're tired of is a handful of people inside of our party picking candidates instead of them. Instead of them. And they are ready right now to be done with the handful of people who are doing the picking and start doing the picking themselves by way of a change of leadership, by way of a change of modality. And you know who figured this out first? Donald Trump. When he said, when he got inside the swamp and saw it from the inside, and I'm now seeing it from the inside, the whole thing's broken. 
It's a few people making the decisions for all of us, and they're not making great decisions. It's time for a new day. We will reunite, reunite um, but we've got to change first. 30-second final thoughts. We'll start with Mr. Sunday. Do you feel safer now than you did five years ago? Do you? Do you feel safer than you felt 10 years ago? The answer is no. And that is the absolute most important question to be asked today. As a father of a son who's in third grade, who's been a prosecutor for a long time in courtrooms, who has fought the Latin Kings, who has been fighting the opioid epidemic for as long as I can imagine, okay, who has fought child predators, who has fought scammers, I can tell you I am deathly afraid of the world that my son's going to grow up in, and I'm going to do everything <laughs> in my power within the 30 seconds I have to tell you that I'm going to fight to keep our community safe. It is the number one most important thing. He ran out the clock. That's it. 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah. Representative yeah. William, 30 seconds. I'm a retired Marine Corps colonel, nearly 30 years in the service, a combat veteran, a federal prosecutor, a state uh, representative. I've been legal counsel to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. There are seven candidates in this field, and nobody can touch my experience. I step into the job on day one, ready to fight criminals, ready to fight in the civil arena, and ready to fight for you, senior consumers. I'm Craig Williams, and I'm asking for your vote. Please join me in thanking uh, the candidates for Attorney General Pennsylvania. Up next, we have a lovely woman that we are so privileged to have serving this state, and I know you'll agree with me. She's the 78th Treasurer of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. She's a businesswoman and retired U.S. Army Reserve Colonel. She's focused on transparency, cutting waste and fees, returning $3.8 billion in unclaimed property to its rightful owners, and making education affordable for those who live in Pennsylvania. She served a remarkable three deployments, I didn't know this, in defense of the United States. She was awarded the Bronze Star twice for exceptional service and received the Legion of Merit before retiring from the Army Reserve with the rank of Colonel. She worships at both the Christian Life Church and Emory Baptist Church. She is Stacy Garrity. Let's give her a well, warm welcome. Thank you, Rose. It's so great to be back here at PLC, guys, and it's so great to see all of you. So I'm Stacy Garrity, and my pronouns are conservative, Republican, woman. Thank you. And right now, our movement is facing a colossal battle. It's a fight for our economy, our values, and our nation. So we have a governor who is just aching to be rid of those awful Republicans who won't let him turn the state government into an ATM. We have a president who measures the economic health of a nation by the size of a candy bar. A president who turned up to give the State of the Union and ended up giving a campaign speech. You all heard that, right? Promoting Bob Casey's bill to fight shrinkflation President Biden said, we're putting fewer potato chips into bags. He said, Snickers bars are smaller. So, to solve the problem, President Biden is seeking help from the same crowd that gave us inflation in the first place. So, we need to understand that this so-called shrinkflation, if it exists, is a result of manufacturers trying to avoid passing along cost increases to consumers. After giving away billions of dollars while shutting down businesses, Democrats like Bob Casey are surprised that the economy is breaking. Instead of spending less, the Bidenomics crowd is talking about more expensive government programs. It's the typical bread and circus economics that brought down the Roman Empire. So let me offer this thought, President Biden. When the snack makers have a better plan to confront inflation than you, it's time for two things, a new president and a new senator.
We have a crisis at the southern border, and the liberals talk about our need to show compassion. Now, it's not compassionate to flood border towns with non-citizens who will need to be fed, housed, and looked after. The surest way to kill compassion is to overwhelm it. Yes, we are a nation of immigrants, but we are also a nation of laws. And we know that no nation can exist without borders, right? So Robert Frost once questioned the notion that good walls make for good neighbors. Well, I think the family of Lake and Riley, the college student killed by a man who entered our country Ill illegally, um, and then he, they know that good walls don't just make good neighbors, they make safer neighborhoods. The fundamental differences between Republican and Democrat policies become clear by the day. We favor energy independence. They are locked into some Futurama version of the world that just doesn't exist. They come with up with almost cartoonish scenarios for why we can't use natural gas, even while it reduces Pennsylvania's greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions by 30%. Republicans want to put the brakes on runaway spending. And right now, Democrats, they're pushing a budget that will swallow up our reserves while committing up to millions of dollars in future spending. The Democrats act like the guy who finds $100 in an old suit in his closet and puts it down on a car. And then when the month is out, he goes back into his closet and can't figure out why the, his other suits don't have another $100 in it for the next car payment. So Democrats keep saying that we have a revenue problem. Republicans know we have a spending problem. They showed a special ignorance of basic economics as well. One of them said these dollars could be spent on programs for Pennsylvanians. So I'm going to clear this up. So children, get off the pavement. The reason we have programs for Pennsylvanians is because we invest our dollars and then we earn interest on them. I swear, we could teach these far-left Democrats how to farm and they would eat the seed. <laughs> but my friends, those are the people who currently have control of our state house. And we have to change that in November or see Pennsylvania decline into another blue state colony of the governing class. We need an attorney general who will pursue lawbreakers, we, as we just heard from our two candidates. Almost 10 years after Kathleen Kane went down in disgrace, we still suffer under mediocre leadership there. We need to hold on to the Auditor General's office. Tim DeFore has done his job with quiet dignity. Two Democrats are running for treasurer, and they're just tripping over themselves to prove which one is the bigger liberal. They lack talent, and neither has exhibited even a rudimentary understanding of what a state treasurer does. One of them, the party's endorsed candidate, is running for treasurer and his state rep seat at the same time. So nothing says career politician like running two, for two spots on the public payroll at the same time. Yes. Never in a million years did I think I'd be able to say, vote for me for state treasurer because I'm the only person running who knows what the job is. And you know what? It's an office that my job, my, we have done great. Uh, we gave back $274 million last year in unclaimed property, a brand new record ever set. Also in our vault, which fun fact, largest working vault, uh, in the nation, we have military medals, and so far we've given back 413, including 10 Purple Hearts and three Bronze Stars. Because that first principle of service, that people are entitled to the fruits of their labors, is more than a slogan. It's what separates us from governments that fail their people. So when Vladimir Putin launched a murderous war of aggression against the people of Ukraine. I ended all treasury investments in Russia. Uh, in fact, I took the action the very same day that Putin invaded Ukraine. We were the only agency in the Commonwealth to get our money out before the markets closed, which is your money, by the way. 
When Hamas launched that unspeakable attack that slaughtered innocent Israeli civilians, using tactics too unspeakable to describe here, I directed Treasury to purchase an additional $20 million in Israel bonds. Pennsylvania has been investing in these bonds since the 90s, over 30 years. So put very simply, democracies should deal with other democracies. And we should always stand against terrorists whose stated objective has been, since 1948, the destruction of Israel and the Jewish people. Yeah. So let's be clear. If Hamas stopped fighting today, there would be no more war. If Israel stopped fighting, there would be no more Israel. So I recently had two Democrat legislators join with extremists from the Democrat Socialists of America in protest outside of my office. So they were angry about our investment in Israel bonds, so they held a die-in um, on the sidewalk outside my office. So they acted as if the actual die-in wasn't started by their friends in Hamas on October 7th when they murdered, raped, and mutilated their way across Israeli communities. So I also acted on another point of principle, China. So from hacking attacks on our infrastructure to theft of intellectual properties to human rights abuses that rival Stalin, the Chinese regime has shown that it will stop at nothing to amass power and undermine Western democracies. So last year, I directed my investment team um, to end all our investments in, in companies domiciled in China. And that process is complete. We're out of China. <laughs> and I believe that the Commonwealth entities would be wise and morally sound in considering doing the same thing. The Democrats are totally trapped in the mindset that government isn't greedy. It only wants whatever money you have left. <laughs> and they must die a little bit every time I return unclaimed property to its rightful owners. And maybe that's why they killed legislation to make it easier to return that money. So no other election has offered a clear choice. Our economy, our values, our democratic system, they're all on the line this year. So we can abandon our allies, spend down our children's inheritance, and become a second class has-been on the world stage, or we can pick ourselves up, stand by our allies, and let the free market build this nation the way it has for the last 200 years. So I cannot stress this enough. As never before, if Republicans don't win in November, the party of common sense economics the party of law enforcement, the party of law and order, the party of both the working man and the businessman. Pennsylvania and the country lose in the years ahead. So let's make our victory America's victory. Thank you. God bless all of you. God bless Pennsylvania. And God bless the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Don't we love her? Let's give her another round of applause. Our next moderator is the executive director of the Election Research Institute, a nonpartisan nonprofit that's dedicated to protecting voting rights by identifying and mitigating vulnerabilities in the election system. Do we have those? In the election system? I'm just curious. Okay. So she advocates for lawful, fair elections and government transparency. She's an investigator and security consultant with over 30 years of experience. And she's the president of Haystack Investigations and the co founder of Verity Vote. That's a research and investigation firm that analyzes and reports on issues impacting election systems. Now, she's a devoted Eagles fan. Really? Okay, <laughs> she's still mourning the 2023 season and holding out hope that 62 will stick around for one more year, or maybe she could rethink her alliance. No? Okay. <laughs> Here is Heather Honey. She's moderating Build Trust in PA Elections panel. Thank you. All right, so on your program, it looks like Cleta Mitchell is going to be joining me for this conversation. Unfortunately, Cleta had an emergency, 
but I am so thrilled to introduce to you Don, Representative Don Kiefer. Uh, Representative Kiefer is currently a candidate for the 31st Senate seat, which covers York County and Cumberland, where we are right now. And she was so very gracious. I gave her just about 24 hours notice um, of, of my need to have a partner for this conversation, and she accepted immediately. So thank you so much for, for doing that, and thank you for all that you, that you do. So our conversation today is about restoring confidence in Pennsylvania's elections, right? This is not a small task. Um, there's no doubt that there is a crisis in confidence in our elections. An Associated Press poll, and there are many of these polls out there, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna share two of them with you. An Associated Press poll last year asked 1,200 people, Democrats and Republicans, how much confidence do you have that the votes in the 2024 presidential election will be counted accurately? Only 44% of the respondents said very confident. Only 44%, that's Democrats and Republicans. Just last week, Fox News released some new polling data. Seven issues were presented to voters. Over 1,000 registered voters were asked how important each issue was to them. Third, I'm sorry, 53% of respondents said that election integrity is extremely important. That is higher than the number of people who responded that immigration is extremely important. So this is not a fringe issue, right? This is a serious issue um, across many demographics. Um, this is a significant portion of the voting public. Now, this is an important issue for obvious reasons, right? We want to have secure, safe, accurate elections. But it also, we have to consider how it impacts the vote. When people don't believe that their votes will be counted, when people think that their votes don't matter, that suppresses the vote. And so, you know, when people raise issues, you know, and, and have concerns and try to express their concerns, the government further suppresses the vote by name calling and um, you know, using pejoratives. And Representative Kiefer, I think that you might have a little bit of experience with that. Right, so I worked with many legislators after the 2020 election trying to figure out what happened. Um, and as we would uncover either an anomaly or something where the county or the precinct or the election worker simply didn't follow the law, uh, we were called election deniers. We were called um, anti-democracy. And the NPR wrote an article, uh, it was in July, I think it was shortly after January 6th, and they were tying anything that you did to challenge or question the election, um, they were calling us, lumping us in, calling us seditionists and insurrectionists. And so they wrote this whole article, they named all of the legislators that had signed a letter that were asking for a full review of the election, a, a full audit, and uh, they said that we were insurrectionists and we were seditionists, and that any time that they report on us, uh, that they would let the readers know that we were insurrectionists and seditionists. Wow, oh, right. And, and you know, the, the, I think the thing that's alarming to me, as it is to, to many of the folks that I talk to, is that the, um, the Secretary of State's office, the, the government as a whole, um, doesn't even acknowledge the issues that are raised. So instead of you know, saying, oh, well, you know what, we had some errors, we can work that out, we can make some process improvements, instead they gaslight and they say you know, that, that it didn't happen, there's no such thing, or that's been debunked. Um, which of course, as Frank Ryan will share with you, it has not been debunked. Um, you know, so last week, uh, Secretary Schmidt had a, um, an online forum where he said he was going to be answering questions from the voters. Uh, and so you were allowed to go online and submit questions to him. So instead of answering questions that were posted by, you know, people who took the time out of their day to, to join there, he instead took the opportunity to talk about what he thinks the biggest threat to our elections is, which is, according to him, misinformation and disinformation, um, which of course is simply code word for anything that they believe to be non-preferred speech and again, their efforts to, to justify censorship. Of course, in February, uh, Shapiro announced the creation of his election threats task force to, again, protect our elections by combating information that they don't like. 
Now, what's really interesting is that um, just days before Obama left office, in fact, one of the last things that he did is the Department of Homeland Security designated our elections as critical infrastructure. And in doing that, it, it authorized the sort of uh, addition of CISA into our elections. Now, CISA is the Cybersecurity Information Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, um, and that's an agency within the Department of Homeland Security. So in June, the uh, House Judiciary Committee held um, a bunch of, a series of, of hearings about this, and they issued a report on how CISA had been weaponized against the American people. Um, and in that report, they wrote that the federal government coordinated with private organizations to police thoughts, ideas, and beliefs. And the report shows how this was like a whole of government coordinated effort. The director of CISA is actually quoted as saying that CISA is in the business of critical infrastructure. And I'm gonna quote here exactly. Um, the most critical infrastructure, she says, is our cognitive infrastructure. And that is, it is the job of CISA to build resilience to misinformation and disinformation. So essentially, we have the federal government, you know, thinks that, that we're too dumb to figure out what's true and what's false, and that we need their help to do this. But I think the most alarming thing, and, and uh, Representative Kiefer and I have been talking about this and are really concerned about where this is heading, is this narrative about threats to election workers. Um, you, you know, every time you turn on the news, if you go to the EAC, um, everybody is talking about it, Shapiro talks about it, Schmidt talks about it, threats to election workers. But when you drill down on that and you think about, you know, you, you find out from the DOJ that there have been, since 2020, 13 prosecutions. Florida set up a um, election crimes bureau and they had zero threats to election workers. And what's interesting is that some of the things that are categorized as threats to election workers are mean tweets. Yeah. Now, of course, nobody condones actual threats, but when we look at these mean tweets, I wonder, uh, Representative Kiefer, can you tell us a little bit about um, your mean, the mean tweets that are directed to you <laughs> and how often the DOJ is investigating right. that? And I see that all the time. I said, you know, it being in public service, right, you get a lot of mean emails, a lot of mean calls. Uh, if you have thin skin, this is not the job for you for sure. And so what warrants a harassment or a threat? And as I was working on um, a hearing that we had two weeks ago with Secretary Schmidt regarding the SURE system, what I kept finding was this narrative over and over again, threats and harassment to election workers. So. I wanted to know what the actual numbers and the data were. And so the national, uh, that national threats and task, uh, threats assessment task force that they had, they said, they reached out to all the election offices and they said, give us any threats or harassment that your election offices have received. So they received thousands, they said thousands, but they prosecuted just 13 in the entire country, 13. And as I was reading articles, uh, the reputable, um, article, um, media outlet, uh, The Guardian. Uh, they've done numerous <laughs> articles, and, and it was, the issue was not that it wasn't real, it's that the, the bar is too high. The bar's too high for threats and harassment, because we have this pesky thing called the Constitution and free speech. And so it isn't that it's not real, we just can't prosecute it, because it, it's not to that level, uh, which is just the irony of it, because isn't that the same thing they say about the elections, right? We're all election deniers because there have been no prosecuted case. They've all been thrown out, right? But the bar's not too high for that, even though we can document and we've cited case after case of all the illegality uh, actions, illegal actions that took place during the elections. But that, there's nothing to see here. But this, this is a crisis. And my, my frustration that I was sharing with you is that this is all fabricated, and what they're going to do is use this to gin up the base. So it's the same thing they did during COVID with all the election workers when we started losing election workers, right? COVID's coming, you're going to die. You're over 65, you're definitely going to die. And knowing that COVID's going to be at the precincts uh, and that you're going to die, are you still willing to work the, at, at your precinct, right? <laughs> well, this is the same thing here, right? All these threats and assessments, it's based on feelings. It's not even based on actual things that happened. It's feelings. So uh, the the, the 
highly partisan Brennan Center, uh, they, they issued their own paper and their pseudo study that four out of five election workers fear for the safety of their, uh, or election directors fear for their safety of their election workers. It's their feelings. Again, we, well, I feel a lot of things, right? It, does that warrant action? But this is being perpetuated. If you just do a quick Google, you'll see it. Um, there's article after article, and I fear that what they're going to say is, A, my first thing is, my issue is that it suppresses the vote. So they're suppressing in-person voting, number one. And number two, they're doing this through getting uh, election workers not to work for fear, right, that they're going to be harassed or threatened uh, because they keep telling them that this is happening, this is happening, whether it is or not, uh, this is happening. You should, be, you should be really scared. Are you sure you want to work? And we're going to start seeing a consolidation of our polls, uh, and we're going to start seeing a shrinking of opportunities to actually go vote in person. Right. Yeah, that's a very, very serious concern. I think that the, the, all of the, this narrative that they've been pushing for so long um, is intended to cause fear. And, and they've been successful, right? Because as, as Representative Kiefer pointed out, the, the Brennan Center did this, this survey. But what was interesting is they all said that they were concerned, that they were fearful of threats. But when asked if they had been threatened, they had not. So why are they afraid? They're afraid because of this narrative that's being promoted about that. And so, you know, when we think about that as the top priority for our Department of State, our chief election uh, official thinks that the top priority is this narrative and pushing that instead of addressing the, the real issues, the real vulnerabilities in our election systems. So the first step if we want to fix something is to admit that we have a problem. And if you compare Pennsylvania's election system to just about any election system any, in any other state, look at Ohio, for example, there are these gaping uh, you know, uh, vulnerabilities, all of these opportunities for bad actors, if they wanted to, to do bad things. And, and what's really interesting, though, is that you know, when you look at election systems, the, the US government knows how to operate safe and secure elections. Look at how they do elections in emerging democracies. Right When the UN is involved, it's in-person voting. Right, They do biometrics. They do facial recognition. You, you have to show up in person, indelible ink on your finger so you can't vote more than one time. I mean, that's what zero tolerance for election fraud looks like, right? And that's why they do those kinds of things. So when you look at Pennsylvania and you see how they are removing every single guardrail from our election systems, it makes you, you know, kind of question why. And when we have this opportunity and everybody's talking about, you know, even the Department of State is saying, you know, we need to... Uh, you know, secure elections, th what they say is that we already have the safest, most secure, right. fairest elections around. And um, so, you know, what, what happens is, you know, if, you know our, we're trying hard, all these different organizations, many of you in here are working on initiatives to restore confidence in our election systems. But we cannot look to the legislature to help us, right? We can't, unfortunately. Uh, we cannot look to the Department of State uh, to help us. And so can you talk to us a little bit about, I mean, I know people are very concerned about uh, photo ID for voting and stuff. Whatever happened in the legislature and why, why can't we count on the legislature to fix our election system? So we came back in 20, the beginning of 23, and uh, unfortunately, we elected the one short window of opportunity that we had to get voter ID passed. Uh, was having a Republican speaker, but um, unfortunately, we had some Republicans work with the Democrats and voted for a Democrat speaker. And so we completely lost any opportunity of voter ID. So that's gone. Uh, so what can we do, right? Uh, we're not getting legislation passed in the House. But the counties have a lot of control. The voters and the local precincts, you have a lot of control. So observation, participation, you could be a poll worker, you can be a poll watcher, you can work with your county. The counties all need volunteers to do various things. Um, and then you have eyes on everything that's going on. You have boots on the ground ready to move if we need help, uh, whether it's, uh, hey, covering this poll or uh, canvassing. Do we have anybody watching what they're doing with canvassing, uh, forcing? truly uh, meaningful observation. I, I can tell you York County just got a document scanner, so all their provisional ballots will go up on a screen. So you can actually see what's on the provisional ballots. 
So it, it, I think many of you may have heard in 2020 when everybody was frustrated and saying, what can we do? And people would go in and ask to get access to the, to the ballots or, or to observe whatever part of the election system, and they were being denied. It's three people, it takes three constituents of that precinct to file for it. And a lot of times we were scrambling to get three individuals, residents, uh, from that precinct to file uh, some kind of a motion to get access to the ballots. But then that, that leads to what our counties are doing. So our counties have full authority. They can say, yes, they can comply with the law. They can look at the law and say, here's what we're going to do. For full transparency, that's the biggest thing, right? If we want voter integrity, right, if we want confidence in our elections and voters to feel secure about our elections, right, transparency. Let's have transparency throughout the entire process. But the state actually fights us tooth and nail. Not only do they fight us, I mean, they take us to court to not have to disclose public documents, uh, which is criminal in my opinion, but your counties could be a backstop for this. Your counties have the ability to take charge here and they can provide full transparency. It's all within their realm uh, and, and we have it's actually documented. Heather will come and say, hey, I heard during this, this testimony, we have it. I can tell you what part <laughs> it is where Al Schmidt said this or, you know, the uh, deputy director said that, uh, where they say the counties have the ultimate authority on many of these things. So let's bring in full transparency at the county level so then when something haps, happens at the state level, we can say, no, 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 we already have a record of this. And we have observers. We have people who observe the process. And then you negate a lot of these you know, false narratives that may be out there or people that misunderstand, whatever it may be, we actually have people that observed and we have witnesses there and boots on the ground. Absolutely, yeah. So again, just to echo that point real quick, I think we're getting a little short on time. I have two really important things I want to talk about. But first, I must say that the county commissioners, the board of elections in the counties, you have authority. A guidance from the Department of State is just that. It is a guidance. The other thing I want to talk about is if you are a candidate, and I know there's some candidates in here, if you were working for a candidate, the candidates can credential people to observe. The candidates can also authorize representatives to go and observe central count, the pre-canvas and the canvas of the mail ballots. We need to have eyes on every part of this. As Don mentioned, transparency increases trust, and we really need to take advantage of all of those things. Um, if you want to sign up, there is a website. It is restoringconfidence.org, restoringconfidence.org. We can give you information about all of these initiatives. But before we go, I want to talk a little bit about Kiefer v. Biden. This is a federal lawsuit um, in which several members of the legislature have challenged the uh, executive order from the Biden administration, Executive Order 14019, have challenged Shapiro's um, automatic voter registration edict, and have challenged uh, the directives that contradict state law out of the Department of State. Um, now, what we're trying to do through this lawsuit is to restore the balance of power in our, um, in our state. And can you tell us a little bit about why you um, feel strongly about this and why Fox News reported that this is the most important legal issue for elections this year? So again, it is about a balance of power. We have certain constitutional rights that were given to us as elected officials. So as a candidate and as an elected official, I have specific constitutional rights. And those have been usurped by both the governor, the, his administration, and the president. Uh, now we've gotten pushed back by some of our legal staff that says, no, 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 you had those authorities, but you delegated them. And while we may delegate some things, right, there are certain things, A, you can't delegate, and B, we never delegate the authority to break the law. And this is what they have done. They have gone above and beyond what the law actually says, what we had authorized them to do. And if we don't draw this line in the sand, if we don't get a decision on this, this is like, again, one more backslide that we will have with you, essentially, the, the Supreme, the courts running everything. Right, right, right. So again, um, we can certainly use your support on this case. Please tell your friends about it. We are. Um, very uh, hopeful of our chances in the appeals court. We were dismissed for standing, as most of these cases are, but this is really a, a really critical case. And if you are interested in, in getting more information following this case, um, on, your, uh, on the goodie bags that you got is the Election Research Institute website. 
you can look on your goodie bag and, and uh, sign up there, and we'll get, send around updates on our cases. So thank you, and thank you so much for stepping up at the last minute. Next, we have a favorite of many here in this state, conservative business leader bringing his experience to Congress. He's the son of a police officer and a wonderful mom who balanced both family and work. He joined Pride Mobility Products in 1988. That's a small healthcare products manufacturer at the time, but he helped it grow into the worldwide industry leader in power mobility products. In 2019, he was sworn in as a member of the 116th Congress, representing Pennsylvania's 9th Congressional District. He is Congressman Dan Muser. You love him. He's here with us today. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Well, all right. I hope everybody's awake this morning. Let's get this thing going, huh? Some great early speakers. Heather, great job. Stacy Garrity doesn't get any better than our treasurer, does it? Come on, you were giving her standing ovation a little while ago. So the clock is ticking, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna get going here. I wanna thank Loam and Henry for bringing us all together today. I wanna thank the Leadership Conference. I wanna thank all of you. Folks, I don't have to tell you, we have many important months ahead of us. 2024 is going to be the most important election. I don't care what anybody says of our lifetime, and these are serious times. And I wrote these remarks with this in mind. We've heard the phrase, it's always darkest before the dawn. Right? You've heard this phrase. But do you believe it? Well, we should believe it because we, in the United States of America, this phrase is part of our history. And we've lived through it from the darkest night to the brightest dawns. Our nation lived through the Revolutionary War, fought here in Pennsylvania, Civil War, Depression, two world wars, Korea, Nam, Iraq, Afghanistan, 9-11, COVID. It was pretty dark until, until we saw the dawn. We made it from Jimmy Carter to Ronald Reagan. That was a rough one. And we made it from Obama to Trump. And right now, folks, it's just pretty damn dark out there. The Biden administration has created countless crises related to our national security and our economy. I'm seeing them in, from the first row in Congress. Regarding our national defense, our military recruitment is way down and wokeism is way up. From the debacle of Afghanistan to the war in the Ukraine, Iran, the Middle East, to tensions with China, there's a complete lack of respect from our allies worldwide and disrespect from our adversaries. And this disrespect is dangerous and creates risk for the entire world. The world needs America to lead. And right now, we are not leading. We are not even leading from behind. We have a Chamberlain-esque policy of appeasement. We have a border crisis that is an unmitigated disaster under Biden. I've been there four times. The president has given a drive-bys. We have nearly 10 million illegal crossings, insane. 1.6 million gotaways. Why would someone that could cross receive phones and, and food and money and transportation uh, uh, cross on, a, on, a, on that sort of basis? The only reason is because they're, they're criminals. Over 400 on the terror watch list. Human trafficking, drugs. Uh, over 100,000 deaths a year, you, you, you know the numbers. As well, we have an energy policy that can be best described as gas backwards. Let's face it, when it comes to energy and national security, the Biden administration puts Tehran over Tawanda and Venezuela over Pennsylvania. Once again, gas backwards. As well, the economic policies of this administration, the wildly excessive spending and the assault on domestic energy continue to drive up inflation making gas and groceries literally unaffordable for countless American families. And of course, the response to inflation has been the interest rate spikes, which has caused housing issues, car sales issues. The typical American family is spending $900 to $1,000 more a month out of their disposable income just in the last four years under the Biden administration. Under Trump, listen to this, under Trump, family savings were at the highest point ever in our history and family debt was at its lowest. Now it's reversed. Debt for families is at its highest point ever, and savings is at its lowest point ever. That's the state of affairs for most of our American families. Small businesses are suffering. Their sales may be up in many cases, but, but their margins are down, their profits are down, and that makes their revenues collapse. As a matter of fact, uh, the small business tax revenues are down over $200 billion in 2023 
contributing, of course, to our, to our deficit and our debt. The service on our debt in the United States of America, when Biden came into office, was $350 billion. This year, it will exceed $870 billion of your taxpayer money being paid just for service on the debt. And next year is going to be worse under the Biden if, hold on, if the worst occurs and, and, and Biden actually puts his budget through. Crime is raining down on us in our cities and in our rural communities. According to the left's ideology, jails and walls don't work. The left's deadly and destructive social experiment is failing miserably. In D.C., carjackings are up over 100 percent. Everything is on the rise. Smash and grabs is regular business in the streets. I've witnessed it myself. Philly, New York, and Chicago, no different. And this is caused by the radical left's reductions in police funding. It's a real simple formula. Um, over the past several years, they've reduced by, by hundreds of billions of dollars. And the prosecution rate in these cities, in many cases, is below 30%. 30% of violent criminals are being prosecuted in the city of brotherly love, for instance, Philadelphia. I have a bill to hold prosecutors accountable, to enforce the laws, so, so prosecutors don't just, aren't just um, officials elected by radical left donors like George Soros and his son, but they actually will be forced to prosecute. The Biden administration is doing its best to ignore this crime crisis. It, it took strong pressure from us, even to get Biden to mention Lake and Riley's name at the State of the Union. Disgraceful. Uh, who was, of course, tragically murdered by an illegal immigrant with, with 11, if not 12, arrests on, on his record. Insane. I was asked last week on Mornings with Maria if President Trump, if Donald Trump would win Pennsylvania. I gave several data points as to why he would win. However, perhaps the strongest reason is what happened in New York, New York recently. If, you're, if you recall a couple of weeks back, of course you do, Trump attended the funeral service of NYPD officer Jonathan Dillon. Uh, who was slain in the line of duty. Meanwhile, Biden was 25 miles away attending a huge fundraiser with the Clintons and the Obamas. How out of touch can you be? Not even was a call made to the family of Jonathan Diller, who left behind a wife and, and, and a one-year-old son. That story itself should keep people from, from voting from this man that's currently occupying our White House. Trump will win Pennsylvania because the voters know we must drastically change course. Brian, Biden claims he, he's doing a great job. And all the problems are caused by the Republicans and the evil, greedy private sector. A vote for Biden is a vote for today's state of affairs times two, uh, the sum of which is a disastrous hole we may not be able to climb out of. As well, huge left-wing Democrat donors, who in my view can best be described as anarchists, such as George Soros and his son, literally pay for such weak on crime prosecute prosecutors. They paid for their, they bankrolled their, their campaigns. And worth mentioning, of course, is the Biden's family scandals. Millions and millions of dollars received in the family member bank accounts that, that went to great lengths to be hidden. Uh, they did everything they possibly could to hide these accounts and money pouring in from the darkest, most nefarious parts of the world. And Joe says he knew nothing about it. Yet there are pictures, White House logs, phone calls, eyewitnesses, emails, voicemails, you name it, that prove otherwise. We know the payments were made to the violent Biden family members and indirectly to Joe Biden. This is a fact. What we don't know, and we will continue to investigate, is what was received for those payments. Under the Biden administration, our freedom is being eroded by weaponized Department of Justice, and the media spins, downplays, and covers it up in the most shameless of manners. The idea that the courts are so outrageously biased against Donald Trump, right, Biden's political opponent, and the left's continuous attempt to remove Donald Trump and other opponents, like RFK, from the ballot are truly the real threats to our constitutional republic. In every instance that I know the full background on a story these days, the media, uh, the media has it 50%, if not 100% wrong. I, I asked President Trump once, I said, how, Mr. President, how do you stand the misinformation, the fake news? And you know what he said to me very calmly? He just said, because I know the truth. I know the truth. I know what the truth is. By the way, I'm going to try this joke on you. How many in the media does it take to change a light bulb? The answer is none. Joe Biden tells them it's changed, and they all applaud in the dark. <laughs> Jeffrey likes that one. That's good. So you know what, though? 
If the fake news wants to stop being referred to as fake news, stop being fake. That would work. But folks, dawn is coming. It comes after we're at our darkest point and it has throughout, as it has throughout our history. Because in 24, we are going to elect a new president and that president is going to be Donald J. Trump. We're also going to win the Senate. Dave McCormick will be our next United States Senator from Pennsylvania. And frankly, any vote for McCormick's opponent, Bob Casey, is a vote for the Schumer, Biden, left-wing, open-border, anti-American, Bidenomics agenda. We will keep and grow the Republican majority in the U.S. House. We have a number of pickup opportunities, and we got to make sure that we re-elect patriots like my friend Scott Perry and many others in our delegation. And me, too. We'll re-elect me. Hey, under Trump, let's look back a little bit. Our national security, our military, the funding was there, the recruitment was there, enthusiasm was there, patriotism was way up. Our energy policy, we weren't just independent, we were dominant on our way to world dominance. Our border was secure. And you know what? Mexico cooperated, whether they liked it or not. Our position of strength with our allies and adversaries was intact. We were feared and respected. The world was at peace. The Abraham Accords were signed. ISIS was wiped out. Today, the Middle East is in chaos. Under Trump, Russia was stagnant, and we had favorable uh, trade deals with China. And regarding our economy, we remember it well. No inflation. It was less than 2%. Interest rates were low. And we had excep exceptional trade agreements once again, which helped our manufacturing grow. And let's say it again. The world was at peace during the entire four years of President Trump. You know, some people want to say that Putin would not have invaded the Ukraine if President Trump would have been in office. I'll just say this. We don't know that for sure. But one thing we do know, they did not invade when Donald Trump was in office. Uh, Russia did invade under Obama and under, and under Biden, the Ukraine. So that we do know. So we together in Pennsylvania have a lot of responsibility. We're going to be playing a huge, important role, just as we have throughout history. So it should be no different for us. First, we've got to come together as Republicans and close ranks. We must get all Republicans, all independents, all traditional Democrats that aren't buying into this, this, this woke uh, stream of thinking to out to vote for America. And that means voting Republican in 2024. The data is in. If we can get those who are undecided and unlikely Republicans, as well as so many Republicans have been really upset by the past elections that they feel their vote doesn't count, uh, we, we, we do all of this. We reach out to these potential voters. We make sure that they vote. We're going to win by a landslide. You know, mail-ins must be maximized. We lost mail-ins in 2020 by 4 to 1. And in 2022, we lost mail-ins by four to one, okay? That's, that's a big problem. That needs to be improved by maybe 5%. We improved that to three to one, just three to one. And again, unli unlikely voters. That's 130,000 Republican votes, just improving mail-ins by, by 5%. So we need to be pushing it. If there's a 1% chance somebody can't show up on election day, they need to get an application and they need to vote early. In-person vote early, or um, uh, mail-ins. We can do this, we have the candidates, we have the message, we have the policy, we have the plan, we have the past results of these policies delivering a better America. So we need you to volunteer. We need you to volunteer in your county campaigns, we need county, your county parties. We need poll watchers. You saw Heather Henry up here a little while ago. We're working on putting together poll watcher training so you can be an authorized and licensed poll watcher. You can be in there counting the mail-in ballots. So please, if you're interested, let's talk. I recently wrote a letter to Secretary of State demanding that we get clarity on election laws and rules. Um, I'm also taking additional steps in Washington to protect the ballot. Um, let me see here. To protect the ballot and the integrity of, of elections uh, with, a, with some legislation that asks for uh, a, a mandated requirement for citizenship uh, in order to vote. Now, that's in the Constitution, but we're going to enforce it on a, on a statewide basis. So, uh, and, and, and what this bill will also do, it will enhance the, um, um, uh, the penalties for transmitting fraudulent ballots in federal elections 
uh, by the use of ballot drop boxes. So we're actually doing a lot. We need you to volunteer um, for the United States to remain the America that we love. I mean, let's face it, that's what's coming down here because we are truly the last great hope for freedom for our nation, for our posterity, for the world. So God bless you. Thank you very much. We have one more panel for you, then we'll break for lunch. And don't forget that 11.30, we will have uh, Dave Perdue up here speaking. So right now, we have a panel that's called the Pennsylvania Chase. This is really interesting. Uh, our, our moderator is a United States political strategist and commentator who currently serves as the CEO of Citizens Alliance. Now, he's been named the door-knocking guru after winning 310 legislative races by deploying teams to knock on over six million doors. He's now returned to his home state of Pennsylvania to launch the Pennsylvania Chase. It's a 2024 effort to knock on 500,000, a half a million doors across Pennsylvania, chasing the GOP ballots. So the aim of the PA Chase is to bring the total number of GOP mail-in ballots up from 20% to 33%. And here to talk about that, and probably the man to do it, is Cliff Maloney. Please welcome him. All right. Good morning, everybody. You're between uh, us, stand in the way of a break, so we'll get right to it. I want to introduce my right-hand man, Mr. Justin Grice. Uh, Justin is the real reason. I'm out there trying to raise the funds and put the resources together. But we've knocked 6 million doors, won over 300 elections. We're going to talk a little bit about it. But Justin, I appreciate you being here with Thanks, us today. Please. Okay, we're going to go to some slides. <clears throat> today we want to talk about something we call the Pennsylvania problem. And when I ask folks this, we always get some interesting answers. But there's really only one answer when you ask somebody, what is the Pennsylvania problem? So let me go to that real quick. Hold on one second here. <clears throat> the Pennsylvania problem... is very, very clear to us. <laughs> now, I like to start with this because people ask, what are we doing back here, okay? We don't live in Pennsylvania. I get, I get called a carpetbagger all the time, but we got such a big problem here that we decided we had to come back. So I want to talk a little bit about who Justin and I are. Justin, you want to talk about this? <clears throat> yeah, Cliff and I both have Pennsylvania roots. Uh, we've been working in the political scene since finishing college. Cliff went to college uh, in, at Pittsburgh. I went to Elizabethtown College just right down the road, bunch of globalist communists there at that college, of course, as most. Uh, but we're both from Pennsylvania, originally grew up in Kutztown, uh, have a lot of love for our home state and travel back here often. Both of our families are here. And of course, being such an important election state, we're glad to be back running this program. Uh, as Cliff said, we've knocked over six million doors in our time deploying young people across the country to help conservatives uh, win elections up and down the ballot from U.S. Senate and President all the way down to school board races. Uh, 310 wins total, lost count at this point, but I think 47 states now. Can't get anybody elected in Hawaii, but we're working on it. Uh, and finally, the Liberty State Project. What we've been spending all of our time on is a goal in four different states, Pennsylvania being one of them, to take over 25% of the legislature with hardcore Freedom Caucus type people. You know, not Dan Musiers, like real Scott Perry people, you know, real hardcore guys. So, all right, so let's talk about the problems we have. We've got no excuse mail-in ballots here. Ballots go out 50 days before election day. And unfortunately, Democrats have used this to have 50 election days. Whereas we have decided we're gonna have one day. Let me say this for the record before I get berated by the crowd. I hate mail-in ballots. Let me say it to this side. I hate mail-in ballots. I vote on election day in person. I don't want same day registration. I want paper ballots. I don't want machines. I want them hand counted. So document that. I wanna get your attention back. And now we're gonna talk about the current rules. I told you what I'd like to have. That is not the world we live in. And so we've got a decision to make. For the past four elections, 2020, 2021, 2022, 
and 2023, we have failed to realize that the Democrats are running up the score when it comes to mail-in voting. I don't like that. That's just the reality. And so what are we going to do about it? <clears throat> okay, let's look at the results. Justin, you want to walk through 2020? Sure. So in 2020, we see the results are clear. Democrats, 77% of mail-in ballots returned. Republicans, 23%. So again, we're walking into Election Day with a 50% deficit. 2022, we're seeing the same numbers. In fact, it went down, of course, due to the election security concerns. Republicans have been going in the wrong direction on mail-in ballots. So what does that really mean? That means Democrats have stopped talking to almost a million people. What do I mean by that? In campaign terms, every dollar you spend is to talk to voters. The Democrats, before Election Day, have already taken a million people out of their spending plan. A million people they're no longer sending mail to, text to, probably still texting them, uh, <laughs> text, all the digital ads, everything they're doing, a million people have been removed from that, while Republicans are still chasing their voters to turn out on Election Day, rain or shine. So when we put these four cycles together, we realize that the average for Republicans is 20%. So this is just mail-in votes. 20% has been the average. So what's the solution? What are we going to do about it? So as we said, we've launched the program called the Pennsylvania Chase, and it's very simple. We want to hire 100 to 120 full-time ballot chasers, match the Democrats at their own game, and go out and knock on 500,000 doors in the state of Pennsylvania from September 1st through Election Day. Would anybody like to guess how many ballot chasers the Republicans had in Pennsylvania last cycle? Full-time ballot chasers. Full-time paid guys. <clears throat> None of you guys ran into ballot chasers that were chasing GOP ballots? I'm sure all of you are pretty strong GOP voters. Democrats average 100 to 150, depending on the cycle, full-time, paid, year-round. Let me say that one more time. Full-time paid year-round. And we're still spending $100 million thinking the TV ads are going to win the election. I hit the mute button, just like all of you. If another Fetterman and Oz commercial comes on the television, we might lose it. We need to figure out how to reallocate those resources to match the Democrats at what they do. So let me talk about what they're doing. What are they doing now? There's no mail-in ballots out there for them to go out and chase. This is phase one, January 1 through September 1. And there are tons of great groups, groups out in the hallway. There are other groups we're working with, we're coordinating with, and we can legally. But phase one is getting folks to request a mail-in ballot. I don't want anybody in this room, I'm going to get fired for saying this, to request a mail-in ballot. Not one of you because you're gonna show up on election day. I'm not trying to move election day voters to becoming male voters. That doesn't change the number. What we have to do is we have to target those million, there's one million low propensity Republicans in the state of Pennsylvania, Republicans. It might sound crazy for you to hear that, but there are a million of them that are registered to vote who don't vote. We have got to do what the Democrats did, which is target them, get them on that ballot request form, and then all of a sudden they're 75% more likely to vote, and they're going to vote straight ticket Republican. A million of them. Okay, so we launched. We've had a lot of fun with this. We're owning phase two. Okay, I'm not trying to take credit. There's a lot of groups that are going to be involved here. Phase two, we're going all in on that. We are getting those 120 activists, those paid ballot chasers. We're knocking the 500,000 doors. But phase two, that September 1 through election day, that is what we're trying to own. And so you've got to look at the different processes of what the Democrats are doing. Okay, what's our plan? This is one of my favorite quotes from Lindsey Graham. The solution is to bomb every country and then make a plan once the dust settles. <laughs> now, the fact that you had to even think, did he really say that? should concern you. This man's a rhino. Keep him away from the Republican Party. Okay. <clears throat> Here are the basics of the plan. We've got to go out and raise $2 million 
That's going to be a pain. It's something we're doing every day. We have raised over a million. Happy to report that. It's crisscrossing the country, meeting with different patriots that want to see Pennsylvania become competitive again. As I said, knock on 500,000 doors. And this is the part that I'm very excited about. Okay, we feel that if we can get to 33% of all mail-in ballots being Republican, that Pennsylvania is extremely competitive again. Okay, so 20% is where we're at. You guys seen this movie? It's a great movie. 20% is where we're at. If we get to 33% of all mail-in ballots, we think we're extremely competitive. I don't want to say we can't lose. That's not accurate. But the bigger question is, what do the Democrats do? How many raw votes do they get? Do they go from 2 million in 2020 down to a million in 2022? Where do they land? Do they let off the gas or do they triple down? Most times, they're going to be chasing ballots like crazy. We know they're in the field right now. So they're probably going to land somewhere between that 1 million and 2 million, which means for us to get to 33%, we've got a lot of work to do. But the cool thing is, it's only 33%. <laughs> we can still lose mail-in ballots. One out of every three, the numbers show us, is how we can win. Okay, one of the big things I want to ask everybody in this room to do, we have launched something called the PA Chase app on your phone. It's both Android and Apple. Justin, you want to talk a little bit about the app? <clears throat> yeah, the app is available right now. In your programs, there's QR codes just like here and out at our table right outside. You can grab this app, and it was designed by some of the greatest patriots uh, known, people that have actually been knocking doors, talking to voters, and their idea was, how can we get an app so easy that we can give an 80-year-old three white claws and get them using that app immediately, okay? <laughs> that's, that's, that's their that's quote. That's a quote. <laughs> their quote, not mine. But you can grab this app right now. You can open it right now from here and walk out of this room and go knock doors. 15 voters, he's got it. Hold, hold that up, show everybody. I don't Look see many phones. Get the phones out, <laughs> act like millennials. Let's get them out, we've got time. Get it out, the PHA app on the app store. Grab that app, but you can walk out of this room and go knock on voters' doors immediately. There's no logins to finagle, there's no hard time. How many have, have actually been out knocking doors on an app before? in their career. So how many of you have got locked out of the app before or had tech problems with your apps before? Yeah, all the same hands, right? So this is, <laughs> this is the app to make it easy. And in this app, uh, I'll let you talk about contact upload, Cliff, but in this app, the door knocking side, we're gonna be bringing in uh, not only the paid folks that are chasing ballots, but also volunteers and working with the county parties and affiliate groups. So we have Fletcher Carper here today. Fletcher, stand up, will you? Fletcher Carper is our grassroots director who will be speaking at various county events and presenting and really walking through this app for folks to make it so easy to use that you can join this as a volunteer as well. And of course, we're hiring people of all ages, anybody, local, you know, from that Patriots just want to help out, we're hiring as well, and that's at phase.com too. Okay. So one of the things that is a daunting task is for me to tell you about what the Democrats did in Wisconsin and how we're matching it here. And I'll get a lot of pushback. In 2018, or excuse me, 2022, this was last cycle, Democrats in Wisconsin were offering $250 for Democrats to upload all their contacts and share it with the state party. Republicans challenged them, took them to court and said, hey, you can't pay people to vote. You know, you're getting these contacts and then pushing them to vote. Court said, yeah, they can pay people money for their data and then have them encourage their friends to vote. The court ruled on it. They said they're not paying them to vote. But talk about an impactful connection. So what you'll find in the app, we have an upload tool. I'd like you to get over the fear of, you know, I don't know if I want to share all my data. We're asking you to share the name of the person and their phone number. We don't get to keep any of it. Superfeed Technologies, the company that we worked with, we built this app alongside Turning Point Action. Okay, so they're trusted folks. We didn't go to some lefty in Silicon Valley. We went right to good people to build this app. But what we're trying to do is to get everybody to upload your contacts. It will match it against the voter file. And you're going to have some very disappointing moments when you learn some of your friends are Democrats. <laughs> but it will match it against all of your contacts to the voter file. And it will spit out and it will tell you 
How many of those people are registered voters in the state of PA? Now, if Bob Smith is in your phone as Pookie, Pookie is not going to match with the voter file. Okay, so there will be a, a drop off depending on how well you keep your contacts in your phone. But our effort is to get people across the state to upload their contacts. We're trying to have 10 million contacts uploaded. And then when we match it, what's going to happen is we're going to be able to send you push notifications so that you can send text messages directly to the 120 people in your phone that have registered Republican and ask them to either request a mail-in ballot or if they've already requested it, you're going to ping them in that last 50-day window and we can continuously follow up with them until it's in. A lot of friends say, oh, I'll vote on election day. Election day passes, you look at the voting roll a week later, and guess what? They didn't vote. Here's what the Democrats learned. If you're 50 days out and somebody gets their mail-in ballot, and they tell you, oh yeah, don't worry, I'm gonna vote. I'm sending it in right now. Well, 10 days later, we can check again. And if they didn't vote, guess what? You go back to Susie and you say, Susie, you didn't vote yet. Oh my gosh, Cliff, I'm so sorry. I'll put it in the mail right now. 30 days out, we check, she still didn't vote. Susie, I'm calling you again, come on now, we gotta save the country. Susie sends her ballot in. You get 50 days, we have time, we can follow up, we can see the data. And we're gonna be able to track all of that by telling you at any point how many of the people in your phone that we matched have voted. And we'll give you the option to call them, to text them, to send them a postcard. It's a connection, it's not a random volunteer. And while you're reaching out to them, we're banging on their door. Hey Susie, Bob told us that uh, you, you told him you were gonna send that ballot in, but we didn't see it come in. Man, these people are nuts. You want us to not show up at your door again? Submit your ballot. Once they submit it, guess what? <laughs> they mean nothing to us. And that might seem transactional, but we're trying to save the country. And Democrats are serious people. That's what they tell people. You want us to stop coming? We can't stop coming until your ballot's in. And I want to say this in a way that won't get me sued. We will do everything possible that is legal in the state of Pennsylvania, comma, but we will match the Democrats at every single thing that they do. And I think a lot of people... If we see harvesting, we're gonna to have to deal with that. You're supposed to only be chasing, but I just wanna be clear, we will match the Democrats at everything that they do because it's that important this year that we get out there and do it. Okay, so the big things that we mentioned to you guys, oh, pachase.com, anybody, anybody that wants to apply to be a ballot chaser, we'd love to interview you and get you involved. We've got Leo Nepper and Fletcher Carper here and R.C. Maxwell in the back. Talk to our teams. If you have any type of local group, we want to schedule and get folks to see what the app does. We want to get people involved in some weekend volunteering. And I want to encourage you, work with all of the groups that are pushing this. Okay, this isn't us saying that we're the only group. We're trying to be cohesive. We want to bring everybody together. And I think with a little bit of hard work, we can get from that 20% to 33%. I don't wanna to have to spend time in Pennsylvania, but we have a major problem here. And I do believe the White House runs through Pennsylvania. I do believe the US Senate runs through Pennsylvania. I do believe we have to flip the PA State House back, not for the rhinos, but for the real conservatives. Gotta have some courage this time. And I think we need to pad our numbers in the Senate. With all your help, we'll make it happen. Thank you, everybody.
mentioned our lunch program a little bit early. I know many of you have already eaten, but I would like to invite uh, the Reverend Tammy Falsick to the podium to bless our food and give us our luncheon invocation. Tammy? Thank you, Brian. I wanted to say good afternoon, everyone, but I think it's still morning. It's still morning. So good morning again, PLC. Would you bow your head in prayer as we come before the great throne of our, our Father in heaven? Gracious and merciful God, creator of all that was, is, and ever will be, we humbly come before your throne this day with praise and thanksgiving for the gift of awakening us this morning, for drawing breath into our bodies with a fresh new possibility of serving you wherever you call. We also thank you, Father God, this day for the freedom you provide, which permits us to gather in a place such as this as we engage in conversation about the future leadership of our land and discuss issues that are of great concern facing us as a nation. We thank you, O oh God, that you also have given us people who are willing to sacrifice their time to willingly endeavor in the politics of our land. May their hearts be open to your spirit and your leadership as they so endeavor to lead others in the path our nation is to tread. May they continually seek your will in all they do. And Father God, we especially thank you this day for our risen Savior, Jesus the Christ, who without him we would have no hope, not only for our future here in this world, but no hope for our eternal future with you in your kingdom. And so again, we thank you and praise you, O oh God, for your eternal sovereignty over all facets of our life, including the bounty that had been provided for us for lunch this day. May the food that in which we have partaken, may it nourish our bodies as your word nourishes our spirits. And it's in Jesus' most holy and precious name we pray. And all God's children said, amen. 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 Thank you. I'd like everyone to please rise and let's do the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Uh, David Taylor was supposed to be our MC today. He had some family matters uh, which have taken him out of the area, so you're sort of stuck with me. In any event, we are very pleased today. We do have Jenny Beth Martin from Tea Party Patriots Action, who's going to speak in a little while. Uh, I will make this announcement right now. If you happen to be a supporter of President Joe Biden, now would be a good time to leave. <laughs> you've, you've clearly, your GPS needs to be adjusted because our next speaker is here to talk on behalf of the, of the not predecessor, but successor to Joe Biden, Donald J. Trump, the next president of the United States. Our speaker has been fighting for freedom for many years. David Perdue began his career, he spent 40 years in business, where he served as the chief executive officer of Reebok. And then, you know all those dollar generals that seem to be showing up on every street corner? He was the CEO of that company, so he's responsible for that. He is a native of Georgia who was first elected to the United States Senate in 2014. During his time in the Senate, Senator Perdue was a champion for term limits, reducing spending, and dealing with the nation's debt. And he is here today to talk to us on behalf of President Donald J. Trump. Please welcome Senator David Perdue. Thanks, Thank you, Norman. Thank you, Norman. Guys, I have great news for you today. I'm not running for anything. I got some more great news for you. Donald J. Trump will be the next president of the United States and will fix this mess. I, I was so glad to get this call last minute this weekend. I used to live up in eastern Pennsylvania. I watched what happened here in 2020, again in 22. We have a lot of work to do here, but I'm optimistic. But there's a reality here that we all need to face up to, and that is that President Donald J. Trump will not be in the White House unless he wins Pennsylvania. That's true about Georgia, too. We have got to get our act together. I'm here to do three things today. One is I want to tell you a little bit about my perspective because you need to see that to know why I'm here and what I'm trying to get across. 
I'm not running for anything. What I'm doing right now is doing everything I can around the country to help Donald Trump become the next president. Why? Because we have to save this country. I'll get into that in a minute. The second thing I want to do, I want to tell you what, what President Trump did when he was in office. We gloss over that, fussing about Biden all the time. We don't really focus on, my goodness, what did we actually accomplish in those four years? And what was on tap for the next four years? That's the third thing, is I want to talk to you now about what he can do in the second term and what we have to do to realize that second term. Look, the world needs us to get this right. I'm going to talk about that as well, but that's what I'm doing. Let me first give you a little perspective. I had never been in politics. I didn't like it. I didn't like most people who were in politics because it was mostly I, I, I. I didn't like that. And so I wasn't very much involved. Until 2013, I got convicted after President uh, uh, Obama got reelected primarily because Republicans pouted and did not vote. That's a fact. I got really upset with that. So I ran, got elected as an outsider. I got, you know, I was in the Senate for six years, and it was such a humbling experience. The highest honor of my life was to serve in the United States Senate. Not because of it's on my resume. I had a pretty good resume before then. But because when President Trump got elected, I could see then what we could actually get done. But i tell you a little story that, that kind of epitomizes how Trump got elected. Certainly how I did. I was sort of the original outsider running against the establishment. I was, my first event, you know, you, what you do when you run, this is 13 now, March of 2013. So for two years, I had raised my hand, I'm going to run against four people who had been in, in Congress. There were three sitting congressmen and a sitting secretary of state in our state, a female. And she was really smart. And what I had to do was run against this, these four people who had been in office for 22 years. So we had the first event, a, a meeting room just exactly like this, a size just about this size. I'm standing in the back. I'm, I'm trying to come in the front door. I'm a little bit late. And... Uh, you know, I, I open the door and this little lady is trying to get in. She's about this tall. She had a cane and she comes in and she stops. She looks up at me and said, I know who you are. I said, okay. I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> she said, you're running for something, aren't you? I said, yes, ma'am. I'm running for the U.S. Senate. She said, I just got one question of you. Have you ever done anything in politics? You ever been elected anything? I said, no, ma'am. She said, well, you got my vote. <laughs> I didn't have to say a thing, guys. I mean, they worried about what shirt I wore, what words I said, everything else. I had it before I opened the door. Why? Because I'd been talking about how bad Washington was. Well, guess what? Who else did that? Donald Trump. He not only had to run against the Democrats, he had to run against the Republican establishment. He had to minister the government as president against the Republican establishment in many cases. So my position is this, is that he will tell you if he were here, and I'm speaking on his behalf, he knows I'm here. We talk, and, and what he is so adamant about is that once we get back in, we can know it'll be easy to fix this stuff, but we got to get there. And we can't just assume that because we won in 16 in a straight-up uh, election that we're going to win in 24. But he'll tell you it's a, it's a very humbling situation uh, to be president of the United States. I can tell you in a much lower level, it was a very humbling thing to be a United States senator. And I remember being sworn in the first day I was up there you stand in the Senate well, you, they, everybody sits in their seats, the new uh, members of the Senate um, come in and you go down to the, the, the dice and you are sworn in by the Vice President. Yes, the Vice President at that time was Joe Biden. But he could make a complete sentence then. So we got sworn, I know, I know, we got sworn in. But I was standing in the back, the doors are open, and. The tradition is you walk in with the two senators from your state, the one I was replacing who was retiring, and the other sitting senator. And so we're standing there, and my wife, the tradition is she stands there, she gives you a peck on the cheek, and then you go down and get sworn in, and you come out. So she's standing there. My wife and I met in first grade. We've known each other, and aw, I get that all the time. We've been married, we've been married over 50 years, so there aren't many secrets in our household. So, and she's about this tall, and not much gets by my wife. So I'm standing there, and I look over, and I'm nervous, and I'm, I'm really nervous, and I feel overwhelmed. And I looked at her, and I said, do you ever, in your wildest dream, imagine that we would be standing here about to go in the floor of the United States Senate and get sworn in? And she said, well, i tell you one thing, you better get over yourself. <laughs> the second thing is, whoever said you were in my wildest dream? <laughs> so it's a humbling thing to be here today. I want to thank you 
for all the work you did in 2020 in January or no, November, December of 2020 in my state, in my race. And I am so sorry that we didn't pull that off for you. Having won by almost 100,000 votes, we got pulled into a runoff because of our state laws. And people like you from all over the country descended on Georgia because they knew if we lost a majority in the Senate, we would be in real big trouble. So I want to thank you for that. In 2017, when Trump was first elected, he had a meeting in the White House two weeks after he was inaugurated. I was in that meeting. It was a leadership meeting of the House and the Senate. I wasn't in the leadership. It was two people from the Senate, Republican Senate, and three people from the House. And I was also in that meeting, small meeting, vice president, president, and those six people. No staff in the Roosevelt Room of the White House. It was historic. The reason I was in that room is because I had been bitching for about two years about we got to get the economy going. And I'd gotten in Trump's ear when he became the candidate, and I ran around the country with him as a surrogate, like I'm doing today, telling people why we had to get this man elected. They said, yeah, but have you heard what he says? I mean, my goodness. I said, yeah, but watch what he does. And I'm here today to tell you, stop listening to what he says and watch what he does. So we're in this meeting. And he conducts it like a business guy and an outsider, just like what he was, not a politician. And he laid out the agenda for the first four years. We worked on regulation, energy, taxes, and a thing called Dodd-Frank. Remember that? We were killing 4,000 community banks a year. You know, he put in place a program, and we executed it mostly in that year. And what we did is we got the best economic turnaround in U.S. history. Six and a half million people were pulled out of poverty because of Donald Trump's agenda and our execution. That doesn't happen. We became energy independent. My goodness, y'all. It, it just, this is an, an amazing issue. Uh, we, we got the economy going. We stood up to, uh, to China. We stared down Kim Jong-un. He sanctioned Russia. Uh, he, you know, he told Iran, we, we, oh, we got us out of the Iran nuclear deal, the insane Iran nuclear deal. And yes, he absolutely moved the embassy, the U.S. embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. This is what Donald Trump did. Part of this is when, when he went in there, we had to focus on getting the economy going. But we also had another catastrophe going on. He had to, we had millions of people under Obama coming to the United States illegally. You heard about that lately? Over 8 million people coming in illegally. We now know that some of these are nefarious. We know they're on the watch list. In my home state, a young woman, 22-year-old nursing student, was just killed by a Venezuelan illegal. And you know what President Biden did? He called him an illegal during the, the uh, State of the Union, and the next day he apologized. Oh, I didn't mean to call him illegal. He's undocumented. Well, wait a minute. Undocumented implies that he just has to get to be documented. Well, the problem is that guy should never be in the United States in the first place. So when Trump came in office, we had the lowest economic output in U.S. history. The poverty rate was 16.5%, same as it was in 1965 when the Democrats passed the Great Society Bill. And we spent trillions of dollars over the next 50 years and didn't move poverty at all. Trump comes in, and in two years, we pull 6.5 million people out of poverty. That's what can happen when you have Republican ideals put in, into practice in the real world. That's what Donald Trump brought to the White House and to Washington in the United States. Now, we all know what happened in 2020. I know it better than anybody. I lived it. And what we have to do now is make sure that never happens again. Nobody's going to change the past. Nobody's asking to do that. What we are going to do is make sure it doesn't happen this year. But when we see now what happens when Democrats get in control, Biden has opened the border. He told Iran, we'll reinstate the nuclear deal. He pulled back on sanctions in Russia. Um, he, he stopped Anwar. He shut down Anwar. He shut down the pipeline. Price of oil went from $40 a barrel to $100 a barrel. Now, who benefits from that? Russia, Venezuela, Iran. And what are they doing with that money? The money went into, into Ukraine fight, for one thing, from Russia. And now it's going to the Houthis, the Hamas, and uh, Hezbollah. That's what has happened under this administration. And he's opened the border. Well, look, guys. We know this is not the America that we all stood up for. I want to thank you for being here. This is so encouraging to me. As I go around the country, I see people just like you standing up and saying, enough. 
enough. And what we're about to do is this. When Trump gets reelected, we're going to fix that border again. He will fix that border. He will become energy independent again. Again. We'll get the economy going again. He'll rebuild the military again. And he'll stand up to China and Russia again. This is the agenda. Now, why is this election so important? Let me remind you of what Chuck Schumer said repeatedly when I was in the Senate and later. He wants a single party system. The reason he wanted the, uh, the vote that he couldn't get on the filibuster is he wants to be able to put four people in the, in the Supreme Court and he calls them activists. He doesn't want jurists, he wants activists on the Supreme Court. He wants to add Puerto Rico and, and D.C. as new states. And here's the holy grail that they want. They want a new federal voting law. Why? Connect that with the tens of millions of people who are coming into the country illegally since he's been in office. You kind of get the picture. They want a, a single party system. We're not gonna let that happen. I'm here giving up my time and energy to make sure that people understand what's at stake in this election. If we don't win this election, we may not get another chance. So what do we have to do about it? Well, it's very simple in my mind. There are five states that will determine the next presidency in the United States. Five. Pennsylvania and Georgia are two. Now, what do we have to do? In my opinion, we have to come together first. Anybody that's divided, and look, I know we're in the primary season, and I know you're hearing from candidates today, and this is our democracy in, in practice right here in Pennsylvania at this meeting today. In most countries in the world, you can't do this. Certainly in, Ru in Russia and China, you can't do it. Well, you can do it in Russia, but we know who will win every election, right? So the reality is, this is democracy at work. We gotta be proud of it, we gotta take care of it, but we gotta make sure that this time we win. And I can't tell you how important it is. I look at primaries as being uh, sort of like spring football. Now in Pennsylvania, I know you've had a couple of pretty good teams up here, you know. Um, <laughs> hey, I went to Georgia Tech. I had to live in the same state with those guys from the University of Georgia, you know, so I, I kind of feel your pain. No, but seriously, it's like spring practice. Spring practice, you fight against each other all day, but the minute that's over, you come together and you look across the field at the other team that are the real enemy. That's what we have to do. You know there are 800,000 people in Georgia, mostly Republicans, out, out of 5 million, now think about that, over 15%, who had voted in November the most ever, did not come back out and vote in that runoff. Why? Oh, I didn't trust the election system. Oh, my vote's not going to count. Oh, they pouted and stayed home. And look what we got. We have two Democrat senators from Georgia who, in my opinion, do not represent the state. We have a White House who does not represent the majority of people in the United States, in my opinion. So we're not going to let that happen this time. So we have to come together. What I'm begging you to do is to tell people you can't, you gotta vote. You can't come to meetings like this and not vote. You gotta vote. You'd be shocked. Studies have shown that many people who are calling themselves activists for one reason or another will not vote. Why? Because they're upset with something, either in the party or with one of the groups or with the election system or whatever. And I'm telling you, if we do that, we deserve what we get. And in many ways, that's what we're living through right now. Now, having, you know, I'm, I grew up in a little church, and I've, I've done gone to meddling now, as they used to call it. But I'm begging you, please, put, put the issues that we have inside the Republican Party. And yes, we have issues. We should have issues. That's what makes us strong. Look, we can win any debate with any Democrat on any day on issues. They can't win on the issues. Look at the cities. I'm giving you evidence today to use with people in the middle. Trump won in 16 and 20 because he got people in the middle to give him a chance. Oh, I like his outside comments. I don't like everything he's saying, but I'll give him a chance. They saw what he did. They voted for him again in 2020. And after January 6th, he said, oh, well, I don't know if I can vote for him again. Right? You've heard it. Not from this group, but you hear it from your friends, your neighbors, the people you go to church with, the people at school. That's what we are competing with. Look, we're all going to vote for him. I'm preaching to the choir here. But what we have to do is make sure that we get the people around us, the influence area that we have, to make sure they get past this little bump. There are two bumps that I see. One is the bump of, oh, I don't like what Trump says. You know what I say to that? Get over it. I do. You should say that. Get over it. 
I was as close to that man as anybody in Washington. There were only two senators, two Republican senators that worked for him in 16. I was one of them. The other guy got to be attorney general and left. I stayed in the Senate because he needed somebody to make sure this agenda got done. And I worked with the leadership there, and we were successful doing that. But it was Trump's vision that caused that to happen. Now, what I'm also telling you is this. The idea of, of electing Republicans is, is a start. We've got to hold those people accountable. How many times have you sent people to your local capital in Harrisburg or to Washington, and all of a sudden they become tone deaf? They, they, they stop listening to you. You know, they say the right things when they're up here when I'm talking to you, and all of a sudden I see head nodding all through the, the crowd here. Well, whose fault is that? Ours. Ours. I put term limit bill in. How far do you think that went? <laughs> That's how smart I am. I believe in it, though. So here's what I'm about to tell you. This is what's at stake. If you don't hear anything else I say today, hear this. They're not my words. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. That's what we're fighting for, guys. It's not passed down in the bloodstream. We have to fight for it, protect it, and pass it on so they can do the same thing. Or one day in our sunset years, we'll be telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in America when women and men were free. Now, guys... Ronald Reagan said that 50 years ago. How appropriate is that today? Look at what China's doing. China is not a competitor, they're an enemy. They do not want good things for us. They want to control you. What, what I'm telling you right now is that you cannot have a weak person in the White House in today's environment globally. I know that. Obama cut our military by 25%, folks. 25%. Donald Trump rebuilt it. That's what we're doing today. We're going to stay out of wars as best we can, but the best way to do that is have a strong defense. And what we've got now is we are confusing the world again, just like we did in 2012. I will share this with you. I was as close to Donald Trump as anybody. I watched him work. Nobody in the presidency, in my, my study of history, I can't find one president that had the reputation or the factual evidence that they worked as hard as Donald Trump did. He would call me at 1.30 in the morning. That's one thing. <laughs> but then he'd call at 5.30 the same morning. It was like we never finished the conversation. It just kind of kept going overnight. And it, it was astonishing to me the energy he, he would have. He's notorious for playing golf, right? Oh, my God. A president went out and took a few hours and played golf. He's pretty good. I have to say that because we, you know, but he is really good. <laughs> So when you play golf with him, you go out, and by the time you get through, you go to breakfast, you play golf, you come back and have a, a bite to eat, and you're, you, you're meeting. And so by the time you get done, you're exhausted. He's like the Energizer Bunny. He just keeps going and going and going. And if anybody repeats that, I hope this is not taped. I didn't call the president the Energizer Bunny, but he has more energy than any of us. But here's what I want to really tell you. I know his heart. He loves his country. He loves his country. He loves his country. The last day of my um, six-year term in the United States Senate, the highest honor of my life, the last day I was given a, uh, uh, a Bible. It was a ninth leather-bound Bible by a newfound friend, actually, that worked in the Trump campaign in 16 and worked again in 2020. Lee Greenwood, you may know the name. And he gave me a Bible. In the back of that Bible, in his own hand, he wrote the following words. I'm proud to be an American. Or at least I know I'm free. I'll never forget the men who died, who gave that right to me. And I'll gladly stand with you today to fight for her still. Because there ain't no doubt, I love this land. God bless USA. God bless you for being here. God bless the United States. And God bless Donald Trump. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you guys being here. Thank you very much. We are going to have results of the straw poll coming up in a little while. Uh, but before we do that, we have our featured luncheon speaker, 
Jenny Beth Martin. Uh, how many of you were ever uh, involved in a, in a local tea party or attended a tea party rally or whatever? A lot of you. We had that a lot around the state. Jenny Beth Martin is the co-founder of Tea Party Patriots Action, and she has ever since been crisscrossing the country, working to nurture the grassroots. So let's welcome to the Pennsylvania Leadership Conference stage, Jenny Beth Martin. Pennsylvania, it is so good to be with you. Thank you so much for having me here today. Hey, Colin, Hannah, how are you? Um, how many of you think Donald Trump was the best president of our lifetimes? And how many of you think Joe Biden was the worst president? And one more, how many of you think, like I do, that this country is on, headed in the wrong direction? You, we are in line with 67% of our fellow Americans, according to the latest YouGov poll. And is it any wonder we think the country is headed in the wrong direction? What is happening today in our country is downright frightening. Our borders are wide open. Schools indoctrinate rather than educate our children. They prioritize feelings over facts. Biden projects weakness to the world with his botched withdrawal from Afghanistan and sends signals our military is more concerned about the transgender agenda than protecting and defending our country. As a re result, the world seems on the brink of world war. Russia invading Ukraine, Hamas terrorizing Israel, China threatening Taiwan. President Trump and his supporters are being persecuted Attorneys who represented President Trump have undergone Stalinist kangaroo courts are being disbarred and face criminal charges. And we have a two-tiered system of justice. A special counsel found Joe Biden willfully retained and disclosed classified materials, included, including sensitive intelligence sources and methods. In his home, his garage, his office for decades, but Biden won't be charged because he's a well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory who controls the nuclear codes. Inflation is eating away at every single dollar we earn. Grocery store prices have gone up 36.5%. Everything costs more. Inflation in this state is 18.6%, costing the average Pennsylvania family $855 more dollars per month than it did in 2020. We want these problems solved right now, right this very minute, don't we? That's why you're here at the Pennsylvania Leadership Conference. And let's give a um, round of applause to Loman for doing such a great job organizing this conference again. We want secure borders, top-rated schools that educate our children, a thriving economy, smaller government, a secure and stable world, a government that respects and protects our rights, politicians who put America first and work to restore American greatness and glory, and a world where our children and grandchildren are free to pursue their American dream. Since 2009, the, when the Tea Party movement first began, we've stood for personal freedom, economic freedom, and a debt-free future. After Obama became president, the stimulus bill was moving through Congress on the heels of Bush's bank bailouts. Rick Santelli, a commentator for CNBC News, said our founding fathers would be turning over in their graves and we should have a Tea Party like they did. We responded to that call to action. The next day, about two dozen of us got on a conference call. A week later, we had 48 tea parties with 35,000 people in attendance. Six weeks after that, we had over 850 taxi tea parties with 1.2 million people in attendance. I was on that first conference call and went on to host the Atlanta, ta the Atlanta Tea Party, organized tax day tea parties around the country, and co-founded Tea Party Patriots. When Rick Santelli had that rant, he asked people standing behind him on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, 
Who here wants to pay for your neighbor's homes who have more bathrooms than you and can't afford their own home? And the people behind him yelled and booed, no, no. That statement really hit a nerve with me. You see, I was going through personal financial crisis after my then husband's company had, had his business had failed. We lost our house, we lost our cars, we went bankrupt, we're living in a rental home, and we declined money from our mortgage company for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac bailouts because we thought those bailouts were wrong. We didn't want to be taking money from our neighbors for a house we could no longer afford. In fact, when Santelli had that rent, we were cleaning our neighbors' homes and bathrooms rather than them paying for a house with many bathrooms we could no longer afford. When I say I want the economy to thrive and to get our country moving toward a debt-free future, it's because I know the havoc financial crisis can cause. And I don't want that for my fellow Americans or for America. As the tax day tea parties went from a, mo a moment in time to a movement, our opposition noticed. The IRS was weaponized and targeted groups with Tea Party and Patriots in their name. Groups around the country, large and small, including Tea Party Patriots, were targeted. Donors to Tea Party groups were six times more likely to be personally audited. Groups faced detailed -like audit, a detailed audit-like questions from the IRS and invasive demands for a list of donors, the names of books that groups with book clubs had, the content of prayers, videos of speeches, and back-end access to our website. All of this had a chilling effect on free speech, assembly, religion, and petitioning the government. You know, those rights protected in the First Amendment of our Constitution. Many groups gave the IRS what they wanted and paid outrageous sums to accountants in order to comply. Many more groups folded. Donations dropped. People did not want to risk the wrath of a government agency who had the power to seize property, garnish wages, and put you in jail. Individual supporters would walk up to me at events across the country holding papers they'd received from the government, asking me if they were receiving those papers because they had been supporting us and were being targeted for it. Some of them were veterans in retired military who fought for our freedom. I'll always remember one man in California who came up to me and he had a cap on his head identifying his branch of the military like many of those I've seen today. His hands were trembling as he showed me the papers from the IRS, the first audit he'd ever had in his entire life. With tears in his eyes, he expressed anger and fear from what his government was doing to him and the country he'd been willing to sacrifice his life to protect. I felt determined to continue to stand for liberty on his behalf. At the time, we warned that if IRS employees got away with targeting us, the other government employees would weaponize the government in even worse ways in the future. And boy, were we right. We saw that happen with the Russia, Russia, Russia narrative with President Trump and impeachment one, and then impeachment two, and then it got even worse, and now Donald J. Trump faces over 100 charges in various criminal probes from around the country. Trump supporters, attorneys, and friends also face indictments from tyrannical government. Some of these people are dear friends of mine, like David Schaefer, who is the chairman of the Georgia Republican Party and a co-plaintiff on Donald Trump's election challenge in Georgia in 2020. Mark Meadows, the House Freedom Caucus founder and Trump's former chief of staff. And Pennsylvania's own Mike Roman, plus electors in various states and attorneys who represented Trump, like John Eastman and Jeffrey Clark. All of them are enduring government weaponization. They have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars, some of them into the millions, defending themselves. All while Joe Biden sits around scot-free with this twisted two-tier system of government, of justice, that has become the norm for America.
It is wrong, and I will do all I can to stand up for these Americans and fight for a better country and a better future for all Americans. Our activists with Tea Party Patriots have stood for a secure border since 2013. And in 2014, we produced a documentary called Border States of America and subtitled, Every State is a Border State. When President Trump first went down that escalator, when he went down that escalator and he said he stood for a secure border and to put America first, his message resonated with our supporters. Today, six in 10 Americans are demanding a barrier with Mexico. 53% now want a border wall, and 83% see illegal immigration as a serious or somewhat serious issue. And anyone who doesn't like Donald Trump's style needs to understand that to change public opinion so much on an issue that so few people were paying attention to in 2016 takes a very powerful personality. And he was right to stand for these things. Is it, is it any wonder, is it any wonder, we all feel this, the, the weight of this wide open border with more than 7.2 million aliens entering illegally in the last three and a half years. A sudden influx of so many people in our country strains resources, it puts strains on communities and schools and hospitals and the government resources. Now, not only is every state a border state, every county is a border county. And Americans across the country grieve the needless, senseless, unnecessary death of a vibrant, athletic Christian woman who is studying to become a nurse, Lakin Riley. The morning Lakin went missing, I saw a post on UGA's X account that someone was missing. I shared it with a few people in different Georgia activist groups. I know many friends with kids at my alma mater, UGA. I prayed that whoever was missing would be found safe. Later that day, I saw she was found dead, and we all learned shortly thereafter she was killed by an illegal alien. She was from my home state of Georgia, and she was from my home county of Cherokee County, where our office is. Her mom had Facebook posts in December and January of last year and this year about events that she was participating in where she said she was having a great time, but she missed Lakin because Lakin was away at college at the time. Oh, those posts really get to me. Lakin is a year older than my twins who are in college. Not a day goes by that I don't miss them with all my heart. And it's so hard to selfishly want them with you and selflessly know you have to let them go into the world. My heart broke because I can't understand how much she missed her child. And now the thought that she'll never see her daughter again, it makes me ache. I've never met Lakin or her mother or her family personally but I've learned a lot about her from the news and from friends and family who know her family. One of my mom friends sent me a text shortly after her death thanking me for the work that I do, encouraging me to keep working to secure the border and saying that, she, that we have to get President Trump reelected. She told me Lakin had gone to our children's elementary school. She went to a different high school, but she went to elementary school where my children went. And my friend sent a note that Lakin wrote in first grade. And as I read that note, I realized that Lakin had the same first grade teacher as my children a year before they did. The note of Lakin, the first grader, said, when I grow up, I want to be a nurse because it helps people get better. And it looks very fun to help people. For working, I want to get $100,000, which was a dollar sign with 10, comma, and four zeros after it. I will not be married. I will stay with my family until I die. I would like to live in Florida. Florida is lots of fun, and the ocean and pool are there. 
Lincoln went on to pursue the goal of becoming a nurse so she could help people. And I'm sure she grew out of her desire never to marry. She loved Jesus and was passionate about sharing her Christianity with, with others. And she loved running and seemed to have the most amazing joy of life. And sadly, she died far too young in a death that was preventable. This year, I'm fighting for a better America and a secure border in memory of Lake and Riley. Every single person who is a victim of crime from an illegal immigrant is one too many. Crime and death happens. It is an unavoidable fact of life. Crime that happens because people who never should have been in our country in the first place, who never would have had the opportunity to be here had the government been doing its job in securing the border, is wrong. Our government is deliberately not enforcing immigration laws, allowing people to enter this country illegally. Every one of those illegal aliens who goes on to commit crimes against Americans are aided and abetted by the United States government. And Joe Biden and Alejandro Mayorkas have blood on their hands. And so do the mayors and governors of every sanctuary city and sanctuary state in this country. How dare they not stand for America first? We are the most charitable nation in the world. We will take care of our neighbors and people in other countries generously and voluntarily. And we are a welcoming country. Our country is known as the melting pot. To maintain the melting pot status, the one where many cultures melt into the American culture, we must, we must enforce and follow our immigration laws, not exploit and break them. We must not overwhelm our systems and infrastructure. We must be a country that respects the rule of law so that those who seek to come here escaping banana republics understand we're not a banana republic. We must secure our border. Those are the reasons I'm fighting today. Each of you has your own story why you stand for liberty for America. We all feel the weight of the world on our shoulders, don't we? We all cherish and love this country, and we know we must save America. To save America, we have to replace the Marxists in the White House with, with conservatives who will put America first. And even if we win the White House, that won't be enough because we have to be able to pass legislation out of Congress and make sure that President Trump's nominees actually make it through the Senate. That means we have to hold the House and win and gain control of the Senate. And once we do that, our work will only just be beginning. You think this year is hard? If we actually pull this off in November and win all three, the next 24 months of our lives will be some of the hardest we've ever seen doing everything we can to pass into law and codify laws that will make America better. To do that, though, first, we must secure and win this year. Secure elections so people have faith in the outcome. Win elections so conservatives have a chance to pass the right legislation and sign it into law. Secure and win. That's the mantra of Tea Party Patriots Action for 2024. You have many people working here in Pennsylvania on securing elections. You have election integrity task forces. I saw Heather Honey, and I know she does amazing work here in the state on elections, um, and many others do as well. Please keep working on this. Check and see if you have vacancies for inspectors and judges of elections, and if you do, can you fill those? If you cannot, and there are precincts that need poll watchers, sign up to be a poll watcher. In 2022, Tea Party Patriots Action recruited over 20,000 people and trained them to be poll watchers, and we'll be doing that again in 2024. Now, let's talk about winning elections. To do that, we have to go to the basics 
which include local organizing, voter ID, and getting out the vote. When you think of traditional getting out the vote, you normally think of door knocking, text messaging, phone banking, you know, those kind of things where you're talking to voters. Usually those voters are people who you get from a voter list of, of modeled voter data. Usually it's not people who you know, they're strangers to you. There's another way to reach people called friends and family campaigning or relational organizing. We've all heard when someone will say, go make a list of 10 to 20 people who you know and, and make a commitment to get them to the polls. And oftentimes those people go to the polls when you reach out and make that kind of commitment. But traditionally, campaigns have a difficult time figuring out whether and who you talk to and what action the voter took. At its core, relational organizing is building relationships with the people you know and engaging them in the political and electoral process with, and with modern technology, conveying that information to the campaign or groups like ours working on getting out the vote. In years past, campaigns have called this a friends and family program. It's simple, really. Relational organizing means talking to your friends and family to ensure they turn out to vote in the election, and with modern technology, it's even more effective. We just heard from Senator David Perdue. In 2020, as we were all worried about what had happened in, in the election here in Pennsylvania and in Georgia and other places around the country, David Perdue was worrying about what happened and also getting reelected. And his opponent, John Ossoff, was only focused on winning the election, the runoff election. And Ossoff changed how to get out the vote to friends and family. Ossoff's campaign had volunteer and paid mobilizers who could upload their contacts from their phones to the campaign. The campaign would then match the, that mobilizer's list of contacts to the targeted voter list. And then they sent back down to the voters their own, or to the mobilizers, their own personalized get out the vote list, their own personalized targets of people they already know who are in their phone books. And then the mobilizers would reach out with persuasive me messages. It was a runoff, so most people's minds were already made up. It was a turnout game. So they confirmed that they would vote the way that Ossoff's campaign wanted to, which was wrong. They should have been voting for David Perdue. But anyway, they did that. And then they asked, what, what is your plan to vote? Will you vote by mail? Will you vote in person on election day? Or will you vote early in person? And then they tracked that. And then as soon as ballots were going out and early voting began, they reached back out to people based on how they planned to vote to make sure they voted. And they kept texting and calling their friends and family day after day until they knew they voted. And once they voted, they dropped off the list. So by the time that the last 72 hours came around, election day and the couple of days before it, they only had a few people left to get out the vote to because those were the people who had not cast ballots. And it was effective. Ossoff's campaign had 2,888 mobilizers who increased the turnout among their targeted voters by 3.8%, and he won by 1.2%. Other Democratic campaigns have used relational organizing as well, most notably in 2020 in Hampton Roads, Virginia, the Progressive Turnout Project increased turnout by 9.2% using a modernized friends and family program. I learned what Ossoff had done right before the midterm elections in 2022. And as soon as I read the article, I realized despite what the polls were saying, we were not gonna have midterm results like we thought. The Ossoff campaign was brilliant, and my hat goes off to them. And the article indicated, and I knew, liberal groups were going to be using this tactic during the runoff. And they did. And the, you better believe they're going to be doing that again this year. So I knew we needed to figure out how we were going to modernize getting out the vote on this side of the aisle.
I researched and I learned that the left had at least four applications and software programs to do this modern relational organizing. Guess how many our side had? That's right, none, zero. So I decided we better write a program, and I used to program computers before I began all this. Um, I wound up running into Tyler Boyer, who is Charlie Kirk's chief operating officer and runs Turning Point Action, the 501c4. And Tyler said they were building an app, so we've joined forces and we're building this app together, and we'll be testing that app in the Georgia primary, which is next week. So we'll be testing it this month and early next month. And if all goes well, which I certainly hope it does, we'll be rolling it out for the general election. Now, relational organizing is not just about technology, though that's an important component. It is about relationships. So here are some steps you can take to begin right now. Develop relationships with the voters on your, in your neighborhood through traditional door-to-door -door knocking. Be an expert and be seen as an expert on the issues to your friends and family. Recruit and train more volunteers. Build your phone list. Host a house party or neighborhood party, and we've got a house party meet and greet guide that can help you so that you can recruit more people now, and then also so you can talk with persuasive messages later in the year as we get closer to the general election. That'll be two different audiences, people who are likely to be volunteers for one house party, swing type voters for the, for the second one. Now, you're the Pennsylvania Leadership Conference. So that means you're a leader, and you want to be a leader. There's a little bit more that you can do for the general election to make sure that you are ready as a leader. Now is the time to research, organize, and prepare. Like, what I mean is go home and begin this tomorrow and next week if you don't have the following information ready for your county or your precinct. But work with the other leaders in your county so you're not duplicating efforts. For your county and each precinct in the county, there needs to be a plan. You need to know how many votes you need to win. You need to know how many people you need to recruit. How many volunteers do you need for poll watching? How many volunteers do you need for getting out the vote? Who is a targeted universe? When are the local fairs and community events, festivals, gun shows? Where will they be? Who will you recruit to host house parties so they can recruit other people? What are the names and locations of each church in your county and who is your liaison for the church? The same goes for high schools, but make sure it's a parent of a student at that school. And the same goes for colleges. Have you reached out to the Turning Point chapter, the college Republicans, the YAF, YAL people to build a relationship with them? Those college students are in the front lines of our culture wars. Make sure that you know all that. But here's the thing, if you don't have it, and I just overwhelmed you with a list, and believe me, the list keeps going, we can help you. And Megan and Linda, who are sitting on the front right there, have iPads, so if you sign up with them, then they'll help you, and we'll get you a handbook to help you organize your county. Also, we have what we are calling meeting in a boxes. And here's one that we have for stopping human trafficking. It's um, focused on, it's, the theme is God's children are not for sale. We have handouts that you can give to people who attend a meeting. We have secure and win bumper stickers and some sort of swag. And most importantly and most helpfully, we have a PowerPoint presentation that you can give, two versions of it, an eight-minute version and a 30-minute version. So you can slide it into a meeting and educate people on an issue of the day and how they can make a difference on that issue. Um, in a short little portion of a, a larger meeting, or if you, your speaker doesn't show up, you can blow it out and, and make it go for half an hour and pretty much take up the speaker portion of your presentation. If you would like to sign up to get those meeting in a boxes and you're a leader who has a group, then see Megan and Linda. You also can go to secureandwin.com to sign up. Again, that's secureandwin.com. Now please allow me to close with this. With all that's wrong today, I still have, I just still have so much hope for this great country of ours. In December, America celebrated the 250th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party. 
In 1776, our founders did not have a representative democracy. They were ruled by a king with little means to push back against his tyrannical will without full-on military war. They knew the dangers of consolidated power, they understood the nature of men, and they lived under tyranny. After the Boston Tea Party and after the Revolutionary War, our founders wrote the Constitution right here in Pennsylvania and created a new form of government that empowered people, protected rights, limited government, and respected liberty. The Constitution has checks and balances up and down, side to side. The three branches check one another, the state, local, and federal governments check one another, and voters check the elected officials. Our founding fathers made sure that our country's new government would have the consent of the governed. And thanks to their wisdom, we can change who rules this country peacefully every two years through elections, as long as we do what we can to secure them. When Benjamin Franklin was asked what kind of government the Constitutional Convention was giving him, giving, you all know the story, he said, a republic, if you can keep it. An answer and a challenge. And I'm bound and determined to keep this republic that we love so dearly. Today's government is being wielded against us like a nuclear warhead. This is no time for meaningless talk. This is the time for action. This is the time for courage. This is the time for tireless dedication to the American cause of greatness. It will take every single one of us who loves this country, from the elected officials to leaders like you to the average voter, to check this out of control, tyrannical, modern government that we have right now through our election system. But I know we can do it. And take note, all of you who are distressed and concerned that this country we love and cherish is on the wrong track. You are not alone. Liberty will not die on our watch. We will never give in. We will never stop fighting. Our children are depending on us to be brave, dig deep, and trust in God to protect them from those who seek to corrupt their hearts and minds, to secure elections so they still matter, and to secure the blessings of liberty for their generation. And we will succeed. We will win, and America will win. And we will keep this republic of ours. Thank you so much. God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you. That's okay. Wow, it's almost time for our straw poll results. And before we do, there are a number of folks that I would like to express my appreciation to for making this conference a big success. I'll start out with the folks here at Depend Harris. Uh, they did a wonderful job with all of our meals. You may have noticed if you stayed overnight, they've renovated most of the sleeping rooms and more renovations are coming up. And uh, you may not see it, but we throw a lot of curveballs at them uh, over the course of three days. And they, they take it in good humor uh, and they make adjustments so that your experience here goes smoothly. Would like to express appreciation to all of the folks at Central Penn Productions in the back. They did all the audio and video. And again, despite all the changes that we throw at them, they get it done. Our appreciation to the Pennsylvania Cable Network and all their folks who were here. This conference aired live. Uh, you may want to check their listings. They frequently re-air the conference a time or two afterward. I uh, also would like to thank a number of people who helped us out. Uh, my wife, Carol, who assists us. Uh, <laughs> Kel Kelly Davis, Scott's wife and his mother and father, took care of all the registration tables and all that sort of thing. Danny Mosel and Everett Hamilton, they did a lot of work for us out there as well. And can we have one more round of applause? The, the real heart of the conference are our speakers and panelists. I think they did an outstanding job. Can we give them a round of applause?
And of course, we could not put on the conference without Scott Davis, and he's going to come out now. And uh, my appreciation to Scott for uh, what we went through the last couple of weeks. He hung in there with us, made things run smoothly. And now Scott Davis has straw poll results. Scott? Wow, what an event. What an amazing last three days. Like Loman said, there's a million thanks to go around. From the staff of the hotel, to the speakers, to each and every one of you. To everyone that took the straw poll, a huge thank you. To my wife, who helped me tabulate, as she's a lot better with Excel in the numbers than I will ever be. To Mark, who helps the spell check at the last minute to make sure I only spell six or seven things wrong. Uh, and everyone that was over there volunteering to help with the straw poll. So let's get into the results. 3,453 ballots were collected over the last 12 years. The Pennsylvania straw poll started 12 years ago, and we have made it a fixture of the Pennsylvania Leadership Conference. A couple key points, 240 ballots collected from Thursday afternoon through Saturday today. We use voter identification. Same way when you vote in your election should be done, right? When you go to vote, we scan your badge, we verify, and then you go up to a random machine and you vote. We validate you only vote one time. One time. We had 10 states represented this year. Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, New York, Texas, Florida, like the list goes on and on. We're not just a conference for Pennsylvania citizens. We truly do carry a national audience and scale. One day we will have the entire state covered in red. And this is the homework assignment I give every year. Go back and talk to your neighbors. Encourage them to come join us. Because once you get a taste of liberty, you come back year after year. And you'll see that in an upcoming number. But take a look at the counties that are in white. Those are the counties we need to target. We are growing. 43 out of 67 Pennsylvania counties were represented here at the conference. And probably even more, you just didn't take the straw poll. About the audience. 59% male, 40% females took the poll. Age, 66 to 74 years old, 27% was the majority of the poll takers. We had 2% under 17. I saw a number of youth tomorrow's leaders. Thank you to the parents that choose to bring their children. Or grandchildren in case of the 75 plus, which represented 9% of the straw poll. History, 42%. This is your second to fifth conference with the Pennsylvania Leadership Conference. 22% of you said it's your first time. And next year, those will be two to five years. 20% or 4% of you said you've been here more than 20 times. I added that one this year. How would you classify your political ideology? Now, this is a tough one, and everyone always gives me, you know, I don't like your answers, you know, everything along the lines, but fiscal conservative, 42%, social conservative, 23%, traditionalist, libertarian, and you can see even moderates. And there is every year one liberal, I don't know how they sneak through the door, or if it's just one of Loman's sons playing a trick, probably that. Uh, but one year, I'm going to put an Easter egg in that if you answer liberal, an alarm goes off so we can track, figure this out. <laughs> Getting into the Commonwealth issues. Should public schools in Pennsylvania be required to post a detailed curriculum online? This is a question I asked last year, and I kept it in because my children are going through it. And I still believe education systems are becoming more of an indoctrination than anything else. It should be about teaching the basics, educating our youth so they can be successful in life. So I kept this question in here again, and 85% of us strongly agree, 
whereas 1% strongly disagreed. Probably that one person. Um, an interesting conversation I had around this one this year was the redefinitions of terms. School districts are now starting to redefine what curriculum means. Is it an outline or is it actually what you're teaching? Well, that's the, the trick, I guess, almost, is we have to pay attention not just the language, but how it's being defined in the legalese aspects anymore. And that was a really interesting conversation, and it makes me wonder if I have to change the question if we ask it next year. Do you think Pennsylvania governments should be, in, or PA local governments should be empowered to declare themselves a sanctuary or just straight up ignore laws that they don't like? This comes into should Philadelphia choose to say, hey, we're sanctuary, we're not going to do this, or we're not going to do that. 86% of you believe yes. State and federal law should be the law. If you want to create a law that's not already a state law, go ahead, create an ordinance. But if there is a state law, a federal law that says you have to report X, you have to do this, do it. I think we all can agree to that. Who are you supporting for attorney general? Are any of the attorney general candidates still here? They're all long gone, so, all right. Dave Sunday, 63%. Craig Williams, 21. So if someone has Dave's call, you know, shoot him a text message. Uh, undecided, 16%. So there's still some people that are unsure. A lot of the write-ins were just along the lines of, I don't know them enough yet. So hopefully after this weekend, they learned about them a little bit more. What is the most important issue facing the Pennsylvania General Assembly in 2024? Budget, election integrity. We still don't have complete faith and trust in our elections. Coming as a former judge of elections and a duly elected constable, I have questions even because not every ballot comes through my election office. Half of the ones that come in to vote I see, the ones that are mailed in never come to us. They aren't touched by us anymore. Can't be challenged by the local people. Immigration, that's 17%. Budget, 13%. Right to life, 9%. Approval ratings. This is what you all came for, right? You want to know how everyone's doing? Stacey Garrity. This is on a scale of five, so this is the average, but 4.3 out of five average. She's doing a great job. Tim to four. 4.02. The House of Representatives. This is where it starts to get interesting. 2.52. We got to get the House back. PA Senate. 3.21. The Supreme Court. 1.9. You guys see the direction this is going, right? <laughs> 1.39. Now, this is an interesting one. And before I hit the next button, there has been more comments from John Fetterman that align more with us lately than I ever would have believed. 1.69. Robert Casey. I asked kind of an early predictor, who would you like to see for governor in 2026? I don't know if Stacy is still in the room, but Stacy Garrity had 7% of those votes. This was a complete write-in. I gave a zero option. I was expecting Ronald McDonald, Santa Clauses, Loman Henry, oh, Loman Henry is up there. <laughs> but you can kind of see the rest. These are ones that people took the time optionally to write in while they were taking the straw poll. They didn't have to write a name, they could choose to skip it, they could choose not to go through that. But Stacey Garrity, Doug Mastriano, Scott Perry, Kristen Phillips-Hill were the top four. 
Hopefully we see some of those names actually announce that they're running for governor. Social issues. In your opinion, do you believe your local community is safer or more dangerous than it was five years ago? So the numbers in blue were last year's. The numbers in red are this year. 22% last year thought it was more dangerous. 40% this year. That's huge. Even going the whole way to safer, less people feel it's safer today. 6 to 4%. Have you ever felt personally or professionally threatened and or intimidated because of your political beliefs? 83% of us felt threatened or intimidated in some way. In some way. This was on a scale of like five as well, but at, in some way, it wasn't just a no. Do you find yourself limiting or editing your social media posts to avoid cancel culture? So the 40% is sometimes, depending on the topic. I think we all should filter ourselves to a degree some way. But if you find yourself sitting there saying, oh, I really want to post this, but wow, it's really insensitive. Like, I know one of my Democrat friends are going to hate me for posting this or unfriend me. Like, that's that mentality. 25% more often than I, did, than I should, but 35 of us, I don't care, I'm going to post what I post, right? What is the most serious component regarding the border crisis? I think we know. Potential terrorists entering the U.S. We have no idea who's crossing those borders, who's crossing either of the borders, the Canadian border with the U.S. is almost just as porous. It's just not being covered. 31% undermining the rule of law, flow of drugs, impact on border communities. And let's be honest, thanks to what Texas and Florida and some of those other states are doing, every state is a border state. It's not just a Texas problem or an Arizona problem. Will your children grow up to be better, worse, or about the same as you were. 66% felt they were going to be worse off. That's roughly in line with where we were last year, which was 67%. 10% last year, 6% this year feel they're going to be better off. So that number has come down. And 16% of those that took the vote don't have kids yet. In your opinion, do you trust the security of the nation's elections? I think we know because earlier we had, you know, that was one of the big issues. So this was on an average, you know, looking at the total number on that scale of one to five. So roughly 1.9 or less than two out of five people are going to feel that the elections aren't trustworthy. Less than two people out of the five. That's one person at each one of your tables if not two, feel the security or trust, or the elections can be trusted. Let's get into the federal, the top three issues facing the nation, economy, government spending, illegal immigration. The additional issues, you want to go, size of government, Joe Biden, 7%. That is a huge issue facing the nation. Right to life, Federal Reserve policies, Gas prices, healthcare, Title IX women's sports, war on terrorism, and the Russia-Ukraine wars. The US, debt the U.S. has hit its debt limit. We should lower the debt ceiling and make cuts across the board. This is an important question. A, I'm fiscal conservative. I believe you have to spend what you make and you shouldn't just go on a wild spending spree whenever you feel like it. Um, but you can see 23% spending reform included, debt limit should not be raised, raise the debt limit without conditions. I mean, that's really what we're doing anymore. But as every 90 days, 100, 120 days, it's on the news. It's like, oh, we're gonna shut down the government if it's not raised another trillion dollars. Like, it's just ongoing. We have to hold our feet in the stand and say, we have to stop the bleeding. 
What do you think are the top three causes of the current continued high rate of inflation? Government overspending? Biden administration policies? Or an increase in money supply? Really, inflation is, you know, increase in money supply. Government overspending leads to the creation of the money. And, well, it's the policies that lead it all. The approval ratings. House of Representatives in the United States, 2.64. U.S. Senate, 1.93. Supreme Court, 3.61. Kamala Harris. <laughs> I had to ask. <laughs> there is no zero. So one is the lowest score you can get. <laughs> She's really close. President Joe Biden. 1.07. He beat her. <laughs> Looking at the 2026 election. Do you think Joe Biden will be the Democratic nominee for president on, on election day? A lot of things can happen. You have the convention, and there's a lot of months in here. 68 of those that took the poll believe Joe Biden will be the candidate on the general election day. 32% of us said no. Now, here's an interesting one. I added the next question, so only 32% got the next question. Because if you didn't think Joe was going to be the candidate, I asked who it will be. But if you said yes, you didn't see this one. Gavin Newsom, Michelle Obama, Robert Kennedy Jr., Kamala Harris, uh, Gretchen Whitmer, Josh Shapiro. Can we get rid of him? Uh, Pete, Bernie, Andy. Oh, even Hillary's on here. If Donald Trump were to be elected president in November, do you think he would do a better job or a worse job than he did the first time? More than four out of every five of us feel he's going to do a better job. Probably the question everybody's waiting for. Who should President Trump pick as vice president? I'm not available, but Ron DeSantis, Sarah Huckabee Sanders took those uh, at 9%. Tulsi Gabbard, Ben Carson, Nikki Haley, J.D. Vance. Ron Paul had 3%. So these are the runner-ups. Ha, <laughs> tricked you. In the running. Vivek and Tim Scott were the top two choices, both with 13%. <laughs> Christy Nome came in third at 12%. Ooh. The top three. With that, I do want to thank everyone for coming to the Pennsylvania Leadership Conference. We hope to see you again next year. Please, when you get here, please take the straw poll. And you need to know the date. So pull out your phones, put it on your calendars, RSVP already, April 3rd through April 5th, 2025. We will see you here at the Penn Harris Hotel. Thank you.